Welcome to the Arlington School Committee. It is Thursday, December 4th, 2014. I would like to welcome Ms. Hansen, the AEA representative. It is my pleasure to announce that Adam and Rita Chapdelaine welcomed their daughter Pearl at 9.30 a.m. Wednesday, December 3rd. Pearl arrived at seven pounds, nine ounces. Mother and daughter are doing great. Excellent. So. Great. Great. Congratulations, Adam. That's 601. Where's Diane? <laughs> <laughs> Live births. Count that one. Is there any public participation? Be, Diane will be here. She's a capital. Yes, I understand. Uh, so we're going to begin with uh, the budget, and I'm going to have uh, public participation. Uh, Ms. Elmer, would you come up? Thank you. She's our special education director, and she will be doing uh, the education FY16 budget. Actually, our special ed leadership uh, team here will be doing the special ed budget presentation tonight. So I just want to start by introducing um, the individuals we have up here. Um, so we have Jill Parkin, who's our elementary um, special ed coordinator, along with Chris Carlson, also elementary um, special ed coordinator, David Dempsey, who's the high school coordinator, and Ben Helfat who is the middle school coordinator. Um, Kathleen Lockyer, who's our early childhood coordinator, will also be joining us, and she's stuck in traffic but on her way. Um, good evening, Mr. Chair and school committee members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity tonight. We hope to use this time to briefly, I've been cued, briefly highlight our priorities for the upcoming school year and answer any questions you may <coughs> have. Um, we'd like to begin by reiterating our support for um, the priorities set forth by the elementary principals on November 20th. Um, in particular, we have recognized through our own hiring process um, the increasing difficulty we have with our ability to recruit, hire, and retain qualified instructional assistants, um, which includes both teaching assistants and behavioral support personnel that we use in the special ed department. We believe, along with the elementary principals, that an increase to these salary categories is necessary. We also support the maintenance of a full-time social worker at each elementary school. We mentioned that it was coming off of a grant that we had had for the last few years. We know that students need to be not only physically present but emotionally available for learning in order to engage in the learning process. The school social worker plays a vital role in creating safe and supportive schools that can respond to the ever-present and growing behavioral health needs of all of our students. Um, also in alignment with the elementary principal's stated priorities, we support the maintenance of the three district-wide board certified behavior analysts, BCBAs, um, and the three behavioral support personnel, BSPs, that are associated with these roles. And Ms. Parkin will speak to that in a little bit in greater detail. Um, in addition to these priorities, we also have identified areas of need in psychological services, speech and language services, um, as well as our contracted services, specifically home services and um, teacher of the visually impaired and orientation and mobility. And Ms. Lockyer, who has joined us, <laughs> will also speak to the needs of the Monotony Preschool. Um, so I'm going to turn to Mr. Helfat to discuss the need at the secondary level for psychological services. Great, thank you. Um, so as our enrollment continues to increase, not surprisingly, uh, our need for school psychologists and our um, has also been increasing. This is particularly, particularly notable in the secondary level, um, where we currently have 2.5 FTEs. Um, the caseload within Audison and Arlington High is on the rise, given the increase of stress demands as well as the growing concerns around transition. During the 2013-14 school year, we completed 257 evaluations at the secondary level. As of January last year, we completed 113. Um, currently, we're scheduled to complete 151 um, by the end of January of this year. So to quantify this demand, a typical evaluation takes approximately 10 hours to complete. Um, excluding sharing this report at a team meeting. So while the demand for evaluation has risen, the need for psychologists attached to each school has also been noted um, to help really all struggling students. Currently, the secondary psychologists travel between both schools and the Jermaine Lawrence program, leaving the school psychologists little time other than drop-ins to assess students and then attend team meetings. Um, if a full-time psychologist were attached to each school, this would allow for a greater proactive involvement in the day-to-day -day concerns that arise for students and have a greater influence on students' prior, uh, student support team's process. 
which works to identify and intervene with students prior to the special education evaluation. Uh, this need is clearly given growing the school refusal cases uh, that were experienced and psychiatric hospitalizations already at 14 this school year among both general and special education students. So we believe this would require an additional 0.5 FTE to make the support available on a full-time basis at the middle school and the high school. Um, another area that we've examined is our contracted services, and we recognize a considerable expense in these required supports. These services are mandated through our individual education programs, which are IEPs, and they combine both direct services to students as well as consultation to teachers and families. Um, our TVI, which I mentioned earlier, was Teacher of the Visually Impaired, and O&M, which is Orientation and Mobility. Those contracts are projected to total over $160,000 this year for those services. Um, we would like to bring those positions back in district and realize those savings to um, direct towards other areas of identified need. Um, similarly, we've done an analysis of our home services as well, and those are projected to cover or to cost about $140,000 for this school year. If we could create new positions and perform those services um, with our own staff, we believe that we would realize significant savings that could again be directed to some of these requests that we have. And Ms. Parkin's going to speak a little bit more to the BCBAs as well as the home services. Good evening, thank you. Um, I want to express my appreciation for the third BCBA this year in our district and for the third uh, district-wide BSP. Some of the work that they're doing is as follows. Um, the current three BCBAs cover 10 sites from preschool to high school. Um, so they share, two of the BCBAs have three sites that they cover, three of the school, and one of them has four sites, compared to last year where it was five and five. So the amount of work that they've been able to do has been greater this year given the, sh the, um, the split of the schools. Some of the work that they do is they're an integral part of the supported learning center programs that we have in the district pre-K through the high school. They d provide a lot of consultation services to special educators and general educators and parents. Um, they assist in the implementation and the development of behavior support plans. Um, including data tracking measures to assess progress. They make graphs, they show them at meetings, um, and it's a nice <coughs> visual, concrete presentation um, that allows us to track the effectiveness of the behavior support programs, but also to show parents and staff the work that they're doing and why we're taking data. Um, and as, in addition to that, they're an integral um, member upon request of the student support teams. These are students who might present with behavioral issues who are, may or may not be on individualized education programs at this time, and they assist in that process. They collaborate, have frequent meetings with building principals, with school social workers. They're often called out in crisis situations. Um, they attend team meetings. They supervise the higher level teaching assistants who are district wide, as well as um, doing consented evaluations per the team process. Um, for the last three months, we took a look at some information just to give you some numbers. Um, between the supported learning center classrooms and some of the inclusion classrooms, so far they're servicing minimally over 140 students. Um, about a fifth of them are in general ed, um, four fifths of them are in special ed. Um, they've also completed or in the process of completing a great number of consented evaluations across the categories of functional behavioral assessments, home assessments, which is on the rise, and behavioral observation screenings. Um, and their number right now is at 36 just for three months. That's a pretty high number. Um, in addition to that, they supervise the district-wide behavior support personnel, those three floating TAs that we have access to, mostly in the elementary, we've been utilizing them. It allows students to stay in the least restrictive environment as much as possible. And currently, we've used the three BSPs just for the last three months in five specific elementary schools serving five specific students with intensive needs. They've implemented behavior support plans, taken data to assess what the need is. They've been able to fade out of some of those cases and, um, and hand them off because they've gotten the kids to a certain level where they can be serviced in the general ed classroom without them, and they are still working with other students, and they're, they're very sought after. 
Um, in addition to that, the current BCBAs do provide some of the home services that we have for some of the students on their individualized ed plan. Um, at currently, for the last three months at count, um, they're servicing eight of the families. I did go back and look at information regarding how many students access home services at this point per the district. And the number is in the range of 25 to 30 minimally. So with our current BCBAs, they extend their hours um, and they do make flex time. Sometimes they're provided fee for service to doing this. It's in addition to their current job. Um, but as Allison said, given the large number of home services and the fact that it's on the rise, um, we did look at those numbers, 140,000, and if we did have an additional BCBA to cover the home services, and that BCBA had a flex hour job, um, it could be that it would be a budget neutral situation minimally. And, um, and the nice thing about it is you'd have much more of an alignment between what's happening in school and what's happening at home. Other districts really are hiring BCBAs to cover their home services as time goes on. Um, and it's, it, I mean, there's a, there's a big budget difference. I mean, to hire somebody from some of the private schools for a contract position is, for BCBAs, well over $100 an hour. So there's a, there's a potentially a kind of minimally a neutral position and potentially um, could help with our budget. Um, Chris Carlson will speak to our speech and language. Good evening. Um, I'm going to speak uh, briefly about our speech and language pathologists that work in our district as one of our related service providers. Um, and I figured we'd start with just discussing what their role is, kind of what the role of the speech and language pathologist plays in our buildings, uh, pre-K right up through 12. Um, so speech and language therapists uh, provide direct services with a focus on the areas of language, including vocabulary, grammar concepts, written expression, social pragmatics, um, the ability to communicate effectively. Um, our therapists also address uh, voice, fluency, stuttering, articulation needs um, in these areas that cause adverse impact on learning for our students. Our speech and language therapists also administer screening, screening tests, diagnostic assessments, participate in team meetings, provide um, opportunities to write goals and objectives for IEPs, and also provide valuable consultation to our, our faculty, our teachers, our parents, um, and our other educational staff. Um, currently at the elementary level, we have 6.4 FTEs assigned. Um, and just to give you an overview, they maintain an average caseload of, of approximately 33.2 students um, across the seven elementary schools. Um, and it fluctuates a little bit um, depending on the school and depending on the needs. But on average, it's about 33.2 students. Um, SLPs provide an average of 28 hours of direct service, and that's <coughs> service meaning in, in the classroom in the general education classroom as well as uh, pull-out services um, for their caseloads. Um, SLPs also provide an average of about 1.7 hours per week of that screening um, consultation related to evaluations, um, both re-evaluations and initial referrals for special education. A uh, major role of our speech and language therapists over the last few years has really been to serve as a supporting member of the student support team. Um, in, in that process, really to help provide direct support services, um, providing consultation, providing screening for students as part of the RTI, Response to Intervention, um, plans at, at buildings. In, re in reviewing our speech and language service model at the elementary level, we've noted important factors related to our needs. One significant factor includes the rising enrollments at kindergarten level based on the increased special education needs from our preschool students coming into our elementary schools. A second important factor includes our efforts, as we've been doing um, significantly over the last few years, to increase our capacity to support the inclusion efforts, um, specifically related to our I RTI that I, I spoke to. Um, as a district, we've developed and we've adopted um, Tools of the Mind curriculum, which focuses on important developmental skill acquisition of our young students. Um, and our SLPs are especially trained to support classroom teachers in understanding that language development at that level um, and really do provide um, a solid base of intervention early on to support a consistent instructional strategies and accommodations. I mean, this is really important for our young students. Um, you know, where our SLPs working closely with our kindergarten, our first grade teachers, really support that early language acquisition. It's very, very important. Um, this past year, um, we, we, what we did is we assigned individual SLPs to support um, multiple schools due to some of the increased caseloads and service demands at some of our larger schools. 
Um, this has created a significant limitation on the therapist's ability to support our inclusion model that I spoke to and our SST process, um, which really provides those important services for our general education students ultimately, um, especially at the kindergarten level. Um, so that being said, we're seeking um, to increase an FTE allocation for our speech and language therapists in the district at the elementary level. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you again. See you. Um, so tonight I'm here to talk on behalf of the Monotomy Preschool, where I've been working as a um, 0.5 interim early childhood coordinator. Um, just to, uh, one of our goals at Monotomy is to really raise the awareness of the really excellent preschool program that we have. So if you'll permit me, I just want to say it is really an excellent program. I've really enjoyed working with the staff and um, there's really a devoted staff who has really formed a great team and we're all thinking together about the best ways for us to respond to the needs of the students. So the news that I have to share with you tonight is that, um, it, and just as a frame, just so that the audience and everybody else understands the mission of Monotomy Preschool, um, it's a, our program is charged with providing services um, for, two children who are 2.9 years um, to kindergarten age when they leave the program and head on to kindergarten. And um, for any students who are residing in the district, the students are referred by multiple agencies. Um, early intervention programs is a major referral source and probably the one that's easiest to manage because we have communication with them. But other sources of referral would be parents other preschool programs in town who see needs among the children that they're servicing or providing services to, parents, um, pediatricians, um, any kind of person, um, you know, would be something like AYCC in town, places that are, are in positions to see the needs of children. DCF is another place that would be referring to us. So a lot of sources can refer children to us. Um, and we have, to, we need to, because there's no, generally not a lot of history, we need to evaluate <laughs> each of those child to some, children to some extent. Um, and that depends on the profile of the child. Um, this year, based on the data that we have for previous years, we've in, experienced an increase, a, a kind of a marked increase in the number of students moving into the district already having IEPs from previous um, school districts uh, where they would have resided and they had developed an IEP and then they come in town um, being between the ages of three, four or five and we need to provide services. We had um, eight <coughs> of those children move in this fall um, who had IEPs and three of those children um, needed to have um, a program placement, a classroom placement. Some of our children come and receive services only depending on what their um, profile is. Uh, we also had anticipated and have placed another um, four children through EI or another referral source than moving in. Um, and just to contrast that with last year, in the whole year of last year, September to June, we had t 10 new students come into programs. So at this point in time, we've had seven. And just a, after a recent meeting today, we have two more children that are look like, during the evaluation process, look like their needs are that comprehensive. So that's, we're up to nine, and I think the month is December right now. So, um, so you know, that, that just gives you an idea of the need. We're also being very creative about the program responses. Um, we're trying to find, you know, ways to service students' needs. Um, with the resources that we have, and I just want to assure you about that, and the staff is very cooperative in trying to do that. Um, so that leads us to a recommendation that I have shared with others internally, <coughs> and I will tell you that, you know, in my other role when I was the, the interim um, director of special education, I knew that that there were more needs than we were seeing surface. I mean, I anticipated just talking to colleagues in different towns that this, the need at this preschool uh, group, age group would increase. I mean, it's not a surprise to me. What is a bit of a surprise is how quickly it's happening. 
Um, and I think that's reflected in the other population increases that you're hearing about in all the other schools. It obviously affects every area. Um, but what I would say is that we're, uh, the request that, that I am sharing um, with the school committee tonight is to create one more classroom, which would be a sixth preschool classroom. Um, the area of need, and it's really a little premature, you know, just in the few months I've been there, but in talking with the staff, everybody agrees that this is an you know, accurate kind of projected um, profile of what we need. I think one of the programs that we need is something between our supported learning center um, or classroom that we have at the preschool and um, the more fully inclusive programs that we have. So a program that can respond to some of the specialized instruction needs of students with developmental disabilities, some of the behavioral and attentional regulation issues which we're seeing even with very young children, which other people have spoke about with other age groups. Um, and that's, that is our hope. That's the group of children that we see perhaps maybe needing some more um, especially as our numbers grow, may be needing some more attention. So we'd look at a model to, to respond to those needs. Um, this year I'm working as a .5 early childhood coordinator. We have a team chair who's a .5. Uh, we have a lead teacher who is a .5 lead teacher because she has other educational responsibilities. And we have a .5 administrative support staff who supports the .5 team chair. Um, and that structure seems to be really working well. Um, I think we all work really well together and everybody's very busy at the preschool, I can assure you, every single day. Um, so it, that is the request and I guess that it's also you know, sharing with you the significant, significant needs in numbers but also in the, the issues that we're seeing that need comprehensive response and will benefit from early intervention. Um, I'm really happy to be working where I am because I truly believe <coughs> early intervention makes a big difference. I think it will, the better preschool program we have, the better programming we're going to have as we move forward. The other group that I didn't address in the written remarks that, I, that were shared with you is ELL. We're having a significant number of ELL preschool children coming. We have two, three children actually two children that are now enrolled that have quite high need for English development. In they, in their native language is their primary um, language. And we have one, ch one child coming in who has a disability but has absolutely no English and no experience in school. So you know, those are children that you can imagine take a lot of time and effort from staff. Um, so ELL is something that we're going to start getting very much more acquainted with as a resource at the preschool. Thank you very thank much. You. Before we start questions, I'd like to thank you. Excellent presentation from my perspective. Uh, any of the members have any questions for this at this time? Ms. Starks. Um, so for the preschool, what is the um, actual, what is the total number needed then? What is the differential? Well, it would be a so new classroom. A new classroom, so that's a new teacher. One new teacher, and our staffing is two support staff in each preschool classroom. So three total. Okay. I'm, I'm not asking for increased um, <coughs> specialists at this point in time. I think the classroom placements is what we need, and you know, so I'm hoping that we can resource um, and reapportion staff. But um, that's what we're missing is another classroom placement, and we have. Of course, the other issue we have is space, of course. Um, right. That's a topic for another night, but we're, we're very aware of the needs there and have some ideas. Cool. Um, and one other? Yes. Um, what was I going to say? Um, the ability, so you talked about the ability to bring uh, some contract work into house. Uh, what are your feelings about how easy it is to fill those positions? Mm -hmm. specialist or ABA therapist um, we, that would be looking at similar to a BSP that behavioral support personnel so a, a, a specialized TA could you know perform that task with some training but we would need another <coughs> BCBA to oversee the home service contracts because 
any um, service has to be, um, the program has to be written by the BCBA, the, the, has to, the consultation has to be with the BCBA, so finding a BCBA would, I think would be relatively easy. Um, there will be a challenge in finding a teacher of the visually impaired um, with the dual certification of or orientation and mobility. So we could look at 2.5 positions, one who is just TBI, one who's O&M, but there are individuals who have both that training. Who we currently contract with is someone who has that, okay. that um, qualification. <coughs> but they are fewer and further between, right. and Perkins yeah. has them all. I know, as you um, get more yeah. specialized, it's hard to find people. So. All right, thank you, that's all. Mr. Pierce? Um, would, would these uh, BCBAs and uh, BSPs be also assigned to the middle school as well? Or? Our, our district-wide BCBAs are currently, it just happens that the bulk of the cases are at the elementary level. When you mm -hmm. think about kids who are typically acting mm -hmm. out with behaviors, you tend to see more of that at the elementary school. But they do um, consult with the middle and high school and have some cases, um, not so much at the high school generally. No. But um, So the need is greatest at the elementary, but they are district-wide positions. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Okay, first on the Menominee Preschool. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, first of the Menominee Preschool, if we open up a, another classroom, we're opening up tuition paying slots for, for the public. What's the offset? Mm. Oh. Um, the tuitions for the preschool represent about 18% of the budget. Mm -hmm. So there would not be a tremendous offset. But there'd be some. There'd be some offset, yes. Uh, and assuming that we've already got an overhead figured in there, I mean, I'm just thinking about how much that would co offset the actual cost of increasing the number of folks right. who are working in there. There, so there would be a little bit of an offset. A little bit of an offset. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, will you need additional equipment uh, to open the classroom? Yeah, we would need to be fully equipping a classroom um, because. It, you know, there might be some incidental things, but we'd be looking for furniture and fully mm -hmm. equipping a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, on the replacing consultants with district <coughs> personnel, sounds like a good thing. Uh, are there any other opportunities for that with it that you've been uh, viewing? Uh, what, what we did is we looked at what uh, we're currently spending on those contracted services, and those were the three areas where we had the highest expense. Um, other services that we contract are AT evaluations, but currently at this point, <laughs> it wouldn't e mm -hmm. be a cost savings to bring that back in district because we don't rise to that level yet, but mm -hmm. it is a growing area, so maybe next year we'll be back here talking the, the, about it. The one it. thing with assistive technology needs is mm -hmm. um, our staff is is really becoming well versed at understanding the assistive technology needs. Um, so the, right now we're really not doing we're really not doing the evaluations. We're doing a lot more screenings, mm -hmm. which is really just looking at the technology that we have, the accommodations, and the supports that we have in place. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our our staff is getting, you know, really strong at, at looking at those needs. Um, and deaf of, deaf and hard of hearing is another area that we have contracted services. But again, mm -hmm. it's it's not at the level where bringing that type of position in district would be. <coughs> Are we seeing any significant change in the population of out-of-district students that might cause us to think about establishing a new program in district? Um, I think that at this point, the, the programs that we have in district, we, we need to spend the time on um, you know, refining and improving those before we would think about adding a new program. Um, we're hoping to get through the 274 grant, which is one of the entitlement grants that we get each year for professional development to work with outside consultants on some program um, development of our existing programs. So I think once we go through that process, we would have a better sense of. And do, do you see any uh, possibilities for further reducing transportation costs based on cooperation on added district placement? Well, um, and, you know, uh, Rick isn't here, our transportation director, but I know that through the lab collaborative, we do get some substantial savings by using their transportation, um, just because of, of we're a member district, but also the vicinity to the programs that lab services. Um, I can't speak to the greater transportation budget at this point mm -hmm. without more information from Rick. Uh, any other things that you, you, you've been here a couple of months now? So, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, got it <laughs> so well, welcome, welcome aboard, and uh, congratulations on hitting your first budget session. Um, uh, 
What other things have you taken a look at that you're, even in the back of your mind, you're saying uh, that this, we, we might be able to improve, we might be able to do something more efficiently, uh, how, we might be able to realign. Are you starting to see those things well, start I think the to appear? areas that we talked about tonight are definitely areas to start <coughs> in, um, by looking at those contracted services um, to see what we could do um, in-house, as well as the home services. And mm -hmm. um, Ms. Parkin can really speak to that need um, in greater detail, but I think that is something that we have relied on outside contracts to do, and it's just kind of grown. Um, so it seems like an appropriate time to try and take it back in. I think it was <coughs> when it started, and uh, Ms. Lockyer can usually probably speak to that. It was smaller, so it didn't make sense to have a position, mm -hmm. but again, as the needs continue, that expense continued. I don't know if you have the, the only other way that I'd answer some of your questions about needs is the increase in, in the autism mm -hmm. category as far as preschool goes. Mm -hmm. But we also have been very successful with Jill's help, help and the help of the BCBAs in really fashioning um, inclusive programs to support children with autism. So while people used to think that needed highly specialized programming, it does need highly specialized teaching, mm -hmm. um, but it, many of the students are successful within inclusion programs across our district. Um, but that would be a category area when you, one of the questions was about looking at our program models. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, you know, I agree with what Allison had said. There's no immediate need for restructuring those mm -hmm. uh, or rebuilding, adding to it, mm -hmm. maybe restructuring, um, you know, our approaches. To, to really cent you know, tailor the programs to the needs of the students we're seeing. And if you would permit me, I just need to add one other thing. I am a .5 early childhood coordinator and I am recommending a 1.0. Um, I think when we look at the structure that we have, I'm not sure that that means a full .5 um, FTE to do that. Um, but I'll be looking more closely at that. But I do think a full-time early childhood coordinator is needed at the preschool. And that person also should be working, which has been an area of concern, working with the elementary principals and the kindergarten so we have a very smooth transition and we're able to really, in a very informed way, plan for the children who are leaving preschool. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as those who get identified in the early days of kindergarten in the fall. I think that would, you know, really fill a gap that I think is there now for, um, for our seven schools um, as they transition in. Dr. Ampey. May I? Um, Go ahead. May I just add to an increased need comment? Um, I think the area of anxiety is something that we see in our general ed inclusion classrooms more and more. Mm -hmm. um, so I do want to acknowledge the work of the general ed teachers in addressing that need, um, along with the school social workers um, and the principals. Um, they're really, um, we've utilized some of the work that, of Jessica Minahan, who we've had as a consultant through our success grant, the social work grant, mm -hmm. and we're diligently working on looking at strategies to maintain kids in the least restrictive general ed setting. But that, I would say, is mm -hmm. one of our biggest challenge, uh, challenges. Even this year, I see an increase in the referrals. You know, I understand our position here is that we've got a limit set on us on how much our budget can go up on any given year. So we've got to give a certain amount of pushback on any kind of increases uh, and, and try to look at how we can balance requests for increases to ways to uh, do things smarter for, uh, for less of a cost. So it, it, it's, it's not the most pleasant question because I'd like to be sitting here saying, what's the best thing to do for kids, period, and I don't care what it costs, unfortunately. Uh, we're not in the position to do that. We understand, and I think also in looking at those contracted services, as I said earlier, and Jill highlighted, I don't think that, you know, it's not going to cost us $140,000 to have a TBI trained teacher. Mm -hmm. So there will be savings from that that hopefully could direct to some of the other requests that mm -hmm. wouldn't be as budget neutral that would be an issue. So. Now, Dr. <laughs> um, so first, just a comment. It would be helpful for me to have to get a list or something that talks about now that you've had social workers in the class in all the schools 
what they're doing every day and over the weeks because it's helpful for us to be able to describe it to other people like town meeting or, or other to explain why you know why there's been this change and, and part of that's understanding what it is they're doing it, um, it, just to clarify would that be in addition to what the elementary principals talked about the last time just so if we're gathering information for you mm -hmm. yes I, I wasn't here last I mean I read I read what yeah. they did but I wasn't yes. here myself okay yes thank you um, and okay so I had a question about the presentation about the school psychologist it said growing concerns over transition mm -hmm. and what do you mean I, I didn't sure which I mean, I think that there's, there's two major transitions that are very anxiety provoking both for students and for families which is the one from well there's three there's one from fifth grade to sixth grade which is a an anxiety provoking transition there's one from eighth grade to ninth grade and then there's one out into the world after that and and those are really what often happens as we get closer to those transitional times two things really happen one is that the anxiety of families of whether that school's going to have what they need whether we know everything we need to know about our students those things cause a lot of um, assessments to be needed for students around those ages. Also the idea of really just making sure that we do have everything in place for the students that we do know are coming up, that also causes more um, work in terms of psychological work. Um, as we anchor the psychologists more to the schools, as well as have that increase, we have a much better chance of working with those students as they come up, whether they be general or special ed, and working with those families as we make our transitions tighter and tighter. Um, and then the one out into the world is, is a much bigger one and it's a much scarier one for families and for students and really knowing what we need to know to make sure that we're sending them off in the best way is an important piece. Oh, I just wanted to I, add too that I, currently our school psychologists only do assessments. Oh. So they're, as I mentioned, they drop in, they assess a student, they go back and write a report and then report it out. We're not using their background, their training, their expertise to support students in a proactive way, so they're not able to participate in the student support team process, which identifies students early and tries to problem solve before they are referred for special ed services because they simply aren't available to do that. Um, and so we do think that a point five increase would allow, we currently have 2.5 between the two buildings and also um, working with Jermaine Lawrence. So to have the 3.0 would allow for a full-time psychologist at the middle school and then two full-time psychologists at the high school so they could par participate in more of that work that would ultimately, you know, hopefully reduce special ed referrals and um, increase student success. And, and I think oh, also can, to can, reiterate can, what um, yeah. Allison just said sorry, is, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, we're kind of getting away. I, I was trying to understand. It says growing concerns about transition, mm -hmm. and we've had transitions all along. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I'm trying to understand what if, if there's growing concerns, what the change I, is. I think is what Jill is speaking to that increase in anxiety that we're seeing across the district that students who struggle with that those things and we, we see that spike at the transition time so students who may have been at the elementary level having some of those somatic you know complaints I have the stomach ache I have the headache well when they get to middle school it's suddenly I'm starting to refuse to come to school or they're coming and they're having a very difficult time and then they're being managed at the middle school level but maybe it's not being fully resolved so by the time they get to the high school and you're in your new bigger building you know those kind of things are manifesting I think across the board districts in general are seeing an increase in students with anxiety and school refusal so that's what we're pointing to. Okay. Well I think I think one other thing just because of the fact that we are seeing a much more complex student through anxiety and school refusal uh, one of the important roles that the psychologist could really play with the increase is to become part of the team and to really be uh, a, a member of the special ed teams in helping to really consult to the team on how to work with students who are suffering from social emotional issues through anxiety and that are, are in the school refusal piece so that when we start to collaborate with the BCBAs and doing home services with some of the students even at the high school level who are having difficulties just getting them to come to school we do have a psychologist as part of the team to really start to be proactive and be a member of that team that can consult to the team to really put strong implement implementations in place to help that student come back into the school building and be part of the school community. Okay, um, how are we doing for time? Go ahead. 
Okay. Um, so the question about the contracted, my question about the contracted services are just, I, I understand if we bring somebody in, we could potentially save some money. Is the need, can the scheduling be worked out? You know, if there's one person, <coughs> can they see And that's what we were speaking to. So for, um, say, the home services, we're talking about 51 <coughs> hours a week of direct service. So that would obviously need to be more than one person. Mm -hmm. But that would be, we mentioned those ABA therapists who would be BC, BSP level um, uh, individuals. So that could be a combination of two point, you know, point fives and a, another point five. Uh, we haven't really um, gotten to that level of detail yet. Um, and for the, and I'm just pulling up the contracts on the other one. Um, for the TBI and um, O and M, we're talking about like actually like 20 hours of service that are costing <laughs> around $140,000. Okay. It, there's also additional consultation and stuff, but direct mm -hmm. service is actually relatively low, so we do think mm -hmm. that we could do that um, mm -hmm. with an individual or a combination. Again, like we said, a 0.5 mm -hmm. for each. Okay, and then finally, um, you talk about if you were to hire an additional BCBA to oversee the services, and I'm just confused by oversee, do you mean? So would, Jill can speak to the requirements of actually when you have um, home services and uh, training, there's a requirement to have them oversee. She's a BCBA, so I she can tell you a little bit about what. There's two types of home service delivery models. One is the direct services teaching the child in the home. The other is we're us utilizing a lot of the consult model because it really facilitates <coughs> Um, parent education and being in alignment with the educators at school. So, um, so the, the consultation model is really what the BCBAs typically do. So a good percentage of our home services on our IEPs are the consult models. Um, and we do periodic check-ins across the IEP year to see how that's going. Does that need to shift more services, less, ser less services? The BCBAs also supervise the ABA therapists. So they have a dual role there the consult to the parents, um, as well as supervising the ABA therapist. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a very helpful presentation. Thanks very much. The question I have, referrals to school psychologists to do an evaluation, uh, I don't know who the question is, that, that, that's from classroom teachers who recognize uh, an issue how does that happen? Well, it's both. So we have students who are on um, IEPs who right. have, you know, the mandated um, three-year evaluation, which would be a compliance type requirement as oh. far as the testing. And then there's the initial evaluations, which referrals can come from families. They could come from teachers, um, you know, the student support team. So you could have two sources <coughs> of referral for the initial evaluation. And the reason why we have an increase in evaluations this year is because be speculative, um, but yeah. um, you know we're certainly seeing a, a large increase. You know, if we're talking about, um, I have was it 257 was completed last year, and we we're talking about 113 at this point, and now or at this point last year, and we're already at 151. Yeah. So we're, you know, many of them are from parent uh, parent referrals. So the parent referrals, not necessarily a classroom teacher identifying an issue. Correct. And we also have outside industries, DCF, uh, group homes, students that come in from the group homes that also uh, come in and are, are referred th through DCF and through other guardian items and, and educational surrogate parents appointed by the courts. Uh, thank you. I was listening to the conversation, the dialogue back and forth about the stress. One of the things that may, may, may be happening is that when you, and this is not a reason not to do this, but when you add more school psychologists and social workers to the, to the system, they surface more problems that were already there. Mm -hmm. They surface stress issues, they surface psychological problems that the kids were having that we weren't able to address. So that may be the reason why there's an increase in stress. I don't think we're at the point where, where I would see that being no? problematic. No, I, I no, 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 it's not a problem, it's a good thing. Oh, yeah. I think it's a good thing that we're surfacing, no, yeah. I know that um, the, one of the largest indicators of people getting knee surgery is having lots of knee surgeons in town. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about kids who are coming to school for 80 days a year. Uh -huh. um, and only then do we bring a psychologist in on the line. And it's not just here. This is happening. I go to principal meetings. 
No, I, <laughs> I, I think it's good to have more therapists. So, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, well, we, I, th I do too. <laughs> you have no idea. Um, <clears throat> but um, no, I, the point I was trying to make is that it's a good thing that, the, that this is happening. It's actually not. I don't see it as a bad thing that we're surfacing more because I think these issues have always been there in kids, and the fact that there's maybe more adults to talk to and uh, get these issues out and addressed is a is a positive thing in this report and in the district. Yeah. People who really have the good information and can really help yeah. move us in, in a good direction. Yes, Matthew was saying the issues the issues were there a few years ago, but we didn't do much about it. But it's also helping to keep kids in the district. But yeah. Before that we were losing a lot of kids to out of district <coughs> because we, we didn't have the strong therapeutic component in place for them here. So all of a sudden they would go to a sub separate program and then they would be removed to an out of district placement. Right. And I think by having more in house therapeutic intervention, I think is also keeping more kids in our in, in our district. Thank you. One quick question. Um, with regard to the contract uh, <laughs> services, these are directly related to existing IEPs, am I correct? Currently, yes. Okay. Um, is this across the grade levels that they'd be servicing? So that, uh, I guess what I'm saying <coughs> is, would these services be graduating in the next, in the near future? So it would be something that would be, Okay. It's our youngest students who are coming in, particularly with, you know, the, the teacher, the visually impaired. I mean, those okay. are obviously services that are going to be, that's not going away, a vi you know, a visual impairment. Um, deaf and hard of hearing, those aren't, those issues aren't going away with, you know, remediation. Those are going to be consistent. I have one last question, and the two groups following can prepare. Do you have a bottom line dollar figure? We are not prepared with one tonight, no. I think that's important for us to have, whether it's through the, uh -huh. for us to see. Uh, I hate, hate to say that education and the welfare of our children is to the bottom line is the dollar, but it is our job to defend that and uh -huh. we need it. Thank you yeah. very much, all of you, for all your work and time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. One, of the, one of the things you should know, sure. in no, in terms of dollar figures, is that when we talk about an FTE, we, we budget it at a particular amount, which we'll talk about um, in the next couple of weeks, but it's, it's really the, it's, it's what we need to find out is what the total FTE is of all of these positions you're hearing about, because then we're going to have to prioritize. Right. Well, not only that, you talked about TAs, you talked about equipment, you talked about uh, <laughs> other things that factors, factors in there as well. Right. So, thank you again. Thanks. And I'd like to invite Dr. Janger <coughs> and his group. If he's bringing you need a group. additional chairs, guys? Yeah, no, we don't need that many chairs. I was actually going to sit up here alone, but since you guys brought a posse, I'm going to tell those guys. And <coughs> sit up with I'm me as well. Before Dr. Jenga starts, I'd like to, anyone that wishes to contribute, uh, I need you to come up and speak at one of the microphones. Uh, everything Dr. Jenga had to say was very important. <laughs> I'm not sure if it got recorded. That's the you problem. Want me to repeat it all right now? No. Thank you. We can pass this around if we need to. Go. Um, so most of what I'm going to say is going to follow the structure of the handout you already have, but I think, so I'm going to go through this sort of conversationally, try to add a little color, and then I think there's, there's so many possible ways you could go in terms of questions you might want answered that I figured it was better to give you kind of an outline and then talk about it. Um, Pretty much every time I talk about the high school, I always feel like it's important to set a little bit of context about the district and the high school. That's why I start with this information about performance. Um, we are an extremely high-performing high school. Um, 
At the same time, we have an extremely old, and um, we all know the state of the facility. Um, at the same time, if you look at our staffing levels, last year we really appreciated the bump in FTE, which brought us up close to district averages, which are still below state averages. Um, you know, and so I just think it's really important to realize we have this high level of performance. Right? We're, an M we're a gold medal school, a most challenging school. You know, now we're a level one school, um, and we're closing up very much on the ceiling of the ability to stay at that level. And at the same time, our per pupil expenditures are below average, our staffing levels are below average, our salary levels are below average, our facilities are in disrepair, and um, we know that it would take $35 million just to fix the stuff that's broken. Um, and so all of the, we, we have very high fee levels in athletics, all of those things sort of are important to set the context when we have these conversations. Um, because we're getting an extremely good product at a very low cost, but in many ways it's not sustainable. I also appreciate what Paul said before, which is that we can only go up so much, and so this is not a just everybody asks and we just figure out what we're trying to do. So the idea is to sort of figure out where to make planful steps to move us in the direction we need to go in what is every year a little bit of a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a little bit about this, and then I'll go to that. I couldn't figure out an elegant way to do it, but I wanted to really look um, at what it's going to happen over time as opposed to try to do it in one year increments because I think it's sort of seeing what we the conversation we had amongst the department heads was we looked at what was going through the pipeline what the staffing levels were in each department um, but then we really had to think about how we were going to prioritize over a period of years so somebody might say well math can get through this year as long as we know we're going to get someone next year um, and so the order and what we're asking for this year reflects a priority over a few years um, in particular, um, the things that really put pressure on us right now in terms of um, staffing levels, and one of the most important, and it actually speaks a little bit to some of the things that special education was talking about. Under the new law, Chapter 222, students who used to come to us, if a student had a felony, we wouldn't even enroll that student. If a student was expelled, we wouldn't even enroll that student. Um, now we have an obligation both to, if we expel a student, we still need to educate them in the same way we used to have to only educate special education students. And if students move into town with a felony, we still need to educate those students. And those are expensive and challenging students to educate. They take up a lot of time amongst the social work staff, particularly the deans, um, in terms of managing those kids and trying to make them succeed. And so it's a rising expectation for us in terms of getting kids to succeed. It's a good thing to do. It's just an unfunded mandate to the, to the district. Um, at the same time, building administrators are being asked, well, all of us are being asked to evaluate every faculty member every year. One of the requirements of that is that every faculty meet member needs to be observed by a building level administrator. So that's over 100 observations being done by the building level administrators at the high school. Um, and on top of that, folks that don't have department chairs are getting picked up, again, by building level administrators. And so in the past where deans and you know, principals would not necessarily have had to cover that, that's something which is falling to administration. And then the last piece is when I talk about rising expectations, race to the top, we are a level one school not because we're really good. We're a level one school because we got better, um, because we closed the gap and that gap continues to close. It's a good problem to have. It's something we ought to be doing as districts. But again, if you go back to 1980, the graduation rate in the United States was 75%. The graduation rate in the United States is 85% now. And the graduation rate in our school is somewhere around 92%. Those kids are more expensive. Um, and so we're picking up kids that didn't graduate before and we're responsible for them. And one of the challenges at the high school is our job is to get them to the finish line. Um, and so a lot of those problems sort of explode as you get close to the end of the line. Um, and then the last, which is the one we're all aware of and the one that we talk most about, is rising enrollment. We have small enrollment increases coming next year, and that's what's tracked there over time. So if now we're at 1294, depending on how you count, and next year we're expecting to go to 1318 and then on up, so that by, I can't read my own handwriting, um, by 1819 we're expecting to be at 1400 students. And so, um, you know, the expectation there is that we're going to have to bring in a number of new teachers just to keep ourselves even. 
we're already below the district average. If we come up to the district average and then stay even with the district average, which I'm not saying is a sufficient staffing level, it's just what we work with and sort of, if you're talking about Paul's balancing out needs, mm -hmm. sort of a reasonable rule of thumb to try to balance things, um, you know, that, that's one way to look at things, just to keep us even with where we are now. Um, and then two things, going back to the understaffing issue that we talked about last year, um, because of historical low staffing, we still have these directed studies, um, which we're really not supposed to have, and it's sort of two, one piece of butter across two pieces of toast. And so it's a challenge for students because we have all these wonderful offerings and then they can't take them. Um, if you come in as a freshman, you have a study hall for half of a set period, half of one of your seven options. If you take a full load, which you're supposed to take, you have one elective option freshman year, one elective option sophomore year. So kids who might get excited or engaged in one of the many elective offerings don't really have the opportunity to experiment and take those things. Or kids who might double up and go ahead on math and science and other things really don't have an opportunity to do that till much later in the game. Um, and then last, another piece of that is the PE requirement, which is something we really would like to fix in the next four years, um, which is that although the state requires, and we are not the only town doing this, so um, otherwise I would have run around much quicker, but I asked all the principals and asked how many other people are doing this. Many are, but w the state requirement is that you give four years of PE. We give three. Um, and we're able to do that because we're able to do that and nobody is auditing it or requiring it right now because they know the state districts are in, but it seems like we ought to at least be complying with state expectations. So that brings me to the site up there. So if you were to take us from where we are now in terms of staffing level, okay, that's not the version I have. Mm -hmm. Mine does not go to 700 significant digits. Mm -hmm. and mine has values on the bottom. Somebody added something to my data and it, it changed it so the formulas don't work anymore. So I'll just talk through it. Do you guys have it as a handout? I, uh, I have it electronically. What's yeah, that? We have electronically. It's, the numbers are fine here. Okay. So this is my version. So you can see this one. Mm -hmm. So if I click on it, do you see the, like, my little pointer on your computer? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll, I'll do it that way. Total left to east down there. Um, yeah. All right. So if you look then um, what we would go up next year, in order to hold us even, mm -hmm. next year we would see about 3.7 FTE. Okay. And then the following year, because we're flat, we wouldn't expect an increase. The following year would be four additional, and the year after that it would be three. Um, and so what we're thinking is really to smooth that out over time. Still not the same. Um, so if you look at the request, what we're doing, I'm gonna flip back for a second. Um, in some ways, to my surprise, when we went through all these conversations, I met with each department chair. Each department chair talked about staffing levels and pipelines. Each one talked about where they wanted to go. And then we sat down as a group and said, what do you think we should all focus on? And everybody said, we should get a new dean. Um, now, I agree, but I know I agree, because I see that part of the world. Um, but the reality was that recognizing, because of this Chapter 222 work, because of the, the issues around sort of supporting kids around all of the work, that they're doing, um, they really see the value of getting that level of service now. Right now we have two deans, each servicing about 600 kids. Um, when you have one of these school refusal cases, or one kid who comes in with a felony needs a program designed for them, um, it's incredibly time consuming, and if we don't do it right, it's incredibly expensive. Paul asked before about how we save money. Um, we save a lot of money, and we have saved a lot of money by finding ways to do this by not sending kids out of district mm -hmm. placements. We could ship them up to Edco West, and every time we have a kid, we go, maybe we should ship them to Edco West if we're putting them out, and then we don't. We put them into our mill. We're putting some now into our Millbrook program. We're working on other places <coughs> to serve those students more and to keep them <coughs> in our own school. Um, but it's very, very time consuming for for any of the deans. At this time of year, you feel like you're spending all of your time doing that instead of dealing with the larger population of students who you know, want to monitor attendance and catch them long before they get in trouble. So the dean is the first piece of the request. I don't know where that's doing either. Um, hang on, I gotta go back to my West spreadsheet now. Um, so then if you look, last year I talked about hard targets and soft targets. Um, at this point, all we're sort of focusing on as a hard target is a 0.4 additional FTE of science. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we went up by a 0.6 FTE of science, thinking that in terms of lab space, that was about all we could fit. The science classes are still large. Um, we still have, I can't remember, something like 15 classes in science 
of 25 or more students, which given our lab spaces is a safety issue, not just an educational issue. Um, we've now carved out what used to be an office and storage space into another small usable classroom and people are sharing in ways that make us think we can fit a couple more classes in there. So we'd like to increase that by 0.4. We'd ask for more if we thought we could fit them in there, but we don't really have a place to put them. Um, so that's the hard target. It's the, the dean and then the 0.4 FTE for the, um, for the science. And then in addition to that, and I put in a sort of red placeholder, we don't really know exactly what the trends will be around the others. You know, one can see potentially needing another Spanish teacher, or one can see potentially needing another Italian teacher, one can see potentially needing both and combining it. Um, but given the trends, given the numbers of kids, we feel that if we have 1.0 to work with, we're going to do the program of studies, we'll do the requests, and we'll see what, where the kids end up. Um, and depending on how that works out, we would spread that most likely among, you know, math would be potentially one more class of computer science. Um, facts would probably be two more classes of cooking, which has been very popular. Um, if we did it in art, it would probably be a, di a digital media or a class or two in order to use the new digital media lab. But the idea is that we'd hold 1.0 to simply cover enrollment issues. Um, there are a lot of classes, particularly in the electives, they're all full. I mean, every elective is a 25 or whatever the lab size is sort of maxes out at. If they've got 20 units, for the most part, they're in 20 units. Not all, but that's sort of the case particularly in those departments. And then the idea is so that if we're asking only for the 2.4 this year, um, the expectation would be that we'd pick those up in later years. So the following year, um, we'd be looking to get, even though we don't go to an increase in enrollment, we'd pull a little bit from this year's FTE and a little bit from the next year's FTE and bring in a new math teacher. Um, and the idea then is going forward, we would know that we would need an English teacher and a social studies teacher by then. As you can see in these sort of fuzzy goals, the miscellaneous line on the bottom gets bigger as time goes on because the uncertainty about exactly how the trends are going to go is unclear. But we know over the next four or five years we're going to need a math teacher, social studies teacher, an English teacher. We'd need a new science teacher if we could fit them. Um, we know we're going to need a new dean and we know we're going to need a new guidance counselor. So the idea is to spread out over time when we think that's going to happen and also let you guys plan ahead in terms of how you staff so it's not every year we come and we want a quarter of this and an arm and a leg to put together a teacher over time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the big money. A lot of the rest of it has to do actually with sort of explaining um, how we cobble together a lot of things from things that aren't always discussed here, but I think it's important to talk about. Technology has been um, a huge jump this year from last year to this year. Um, last year I came to you and whined pretty copiously about <laughs> six and seven year old computers and now we have Every teacher has a new laptop. There's about 80 uh, MacBooks and Chromebooks. The computer lab um, has created, pr the problem with the computer lab was we, it was the STEM computing lab, and it's now become the STEM computing classroom because we filled it with computer classes. Um, so now we're gonna get a laptop cart, which will be shared with science, or mainly in science, and then shared back the other way to math. Um, we're looking, and that's, the laptop card is grant funded, the STEM lab is grant funded, um, the digital media lab that we're going to put in next year will be lab funded. Um, <clears throat> the um, other thing that we're proposing is to bring in another roughly 80, no, actually it's more than 80. <coughs> if I believe the numbers, it would be roughly 200 devices um, through a grant. Um, which we're not sure we'll be able to get, but that's the goal, to get anywhere from 80 to 200 new smaller devices, Chromebooks or iPads, to spread out to classrooms to start to build out towards what's called a BYOD model, where teachers have enough devices in their classroom to be able to support and expect that students are gonna be connected <coughs> anywhere and that they're sort of prepared to support students bringing their own computer devices into the building. Um, and Laura Chesson has been talking to Capital about that, getting grants together for that. Teachers are often doing that through smaller grants, also through AEF. And so a, a lot of activities bringing that work in, and that's not in some ways always being funded here. Um, jumping on from that, as we have these um, conversations about staffing, one of the questions I keep asking is where do we put them? Um, we know the building is in difficult shape. We know that we're waiting to hear whether or not our SOI is supported. But it's important to realize that if 
even if we heard tomorrow mm -hmm. and we broke ground in 2017 and it took the fastest way possible two years, the kids in eighth grade right now are going to be graduating from a version of this building. Um, they're not going to be in any kind of new building. And so if we're talking about painting something and you should need to paint it every five years, we need to paint it this <coughs> year. If you're talking about um, a classroom space or infrastructure, when I asked David Good about the wireless technology we're putting in and said, you know, is there anything we shouldn't be doing because it's a waste of money? His answer was no, the stuff we put in now is going to be gone in five years anyway, mm -hmm. because that's the lifetime of that sort of work. Um, and so it really has been a challenge. I mean, one of the biggest ticket items, which I'll point at Melissa to probably talk more about, but you know, we have a 13-year-old turf field. They have a 10-year life. Um, and we're not going to figure out what we're going to do before we have to make a decision about how we're going to use that. That's a central place where we do most of our big games. It's also a revenue producer for the, for the community. So those sorts of things have to be done. Specifically, um, we have heating issues. I, don't, I think there's already been at least five days this year when most of Bill McCarthy's time was spent on a day shifting teachers in and out of classrooms or dealing with heating issues because it was either freezing <coughs> cold or boiling hot in the day. Um, and that's, we haven't even gotten into the tough part of the year yet. You know, we have leaky roofs. Again, we're moving teachers out of classrooms. We have doors that are broken and difficult to secure. Um, we have problems with parking and we need to repaint the parking lot and pave the parking lot so we can figure out where everyone needs to park um, because we can't even count the number of parking spaces. We just sort of park everywhere. Um, we have a very small number of cameras that don't really give us very high resolution and don't cover all the spots that need to be covered. I mean, all of those things, we spent, I think, $9,000 doing sort of a skim coat of painting in the locker rooms, which were so appalling that I wouldn't even go into them, let alone use them as a locker room. And now they're kind of maybe a little okay, but need more work. And so that's going to have to be something that we're going to have to support. We're going to have to support maintenance doing it, the town doing it. Um, I think Kathy can attest to probably that's something that takes up a converse, part of our conversation every two weeks when we get together. Um, athletics um, is again something where I think, and again I'll point to you more, but it's a challenging budget with athletics um, that sort of, when, I, when we came in and we spoke to Diane last year, her basic take on athletics was that um, spending in athletics over the last years prior to her had always been sort of a little beyond whatever was budgeted. Um, now, but athletics is again offset by revenues, it's offset by fees, and it's offset by revenues that are brought in by tickets. And I know Melissa's done a really good job of focusing on you know, saving things, making better use of time, bringing in revenues, and creating those opportunities. Um, and so, but as you look at that, I think we need again to get that in, in check. So the number that we actually shot for last year and the number we shot for this year isn't the number that's on paper. It's the number that we looked and seemed like the historical low mark and we've stayed within that mark. <coughs> but I think it's important as you guys look, if I was to look at that, I might say, why are you over budget? Um, and it's like, well, because at the beginning of the year we said that's how much it's gonna cost. Um, and so I know that we scraped the money together from other places. Um, I don't know, do you wanna say anything more about, about athletics? And because. She's got spreadsheets that I wish I had for my own thing. But, um, and I know there's a scheduled at some point. When is the athletic conversation? There was at some point a report, or because you had talked a lot about having a, an athletic presentation in the future. Is that scheduled, or is that a future event? The athletic. He, Cindy was asking to have uh, an actual presentation on athletics. On athletics, yes. We want to have it. That, that's something that's going to be scheduled. But I do think it would be appropriate at this point just to have the committee be aware of yeah. the, the state of the field because this is significant. And as we have looked at the possible renovation of the school, it first of all would never be covered in a renovation. It just would be outside of that completely. And um, I think that we did not understand until quite recently, I'll let Melissa speak to this a little bit more herself, but. I don't think we really appreciated the um, state of the field in terms of safety. And maybe Melissa you could just talk a little bit about this and maybe Diane might want to talk a little bit how this might work in capital if it's going to work. That's the other problem. Just one second. We're talking about the artificial turf field. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
thought it lasted forever, but apparently it only lasts 10 years. Five to 10, depending on the, the, the weight of usage. And it had been in the Capital Budget Committee for replacement. Right. Okay. Go but ahead. it got kicked. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Because of the high school plan, they felt it wasn't prudent to invest a half a million dollars in a field that we could have trucks driving over when we start construction. Okay. So that was based well, was on an expectation of a faster. Yes, thank you. Um, so I did provide some spreadsheets, as Matthew alluded um, to, around athletics, and that's really nothing to review. Just for your own information, as he noted, the athletic budget can be tricky, and there are a lot of costs that um, may not always be visible, but they're very present and quite often very large. Uh, so I thought it might be helpful as we're assessing the athletic um, investments moving forward for you to have that information. In terms of the turf, um, we had it tested. There is a test called GMAX that comes around. And what they do is they test the impact of a fall. So if, um, how much give, essentially, the surface has. So when the turf was put in, um, the fibers were a lot stronger that they are, uh, than they are now, and they could hold the infill. And with them holding the infill well, when there was contact on the turf, there was a lot of give. Over time, obviously, that give lessens. Um, so they do a GMAX testing where they go around <coughs> to the turf and they test different parts throughout and they rate it um, on a 1 or a 0 to a 200 scale. 175 is considered failing uh, and no longer safe. We are right there. Uh, we are pushing that limit. Um, and one other intricacy of our surface is that when it was put in, every five yards they had a different, if you notice there's a dark green and a light green. Mm -hmm. So it was two different turf fibers, um, really just because of the shades of color, but they have worn differently, uh, basically just from the way that they absorb sunlight. Because of that, every five yards, there's a quarter of an inch to a half an inch <coughs> in the surface, uh, which doesn't present a safety issue for lacrosse or football, but for a sport like soccer or field hockey, it can be um, dangerous. So we had the testing done in early September. Um, we are right at the brink of, you know, crossing over that line of the turf not being recommended for use. And uh, it was something that we brought to Kathy and Diane's attention in terms of how we're going to move forward. Go ahead. Why don't we move back to grass? Maintenance. Um, I mean, overall, wouldn't it be less money two, over two time? Pro two problems with maintenance. One of it is it's a toxic waste dump that's capped. And to go back to turf would, of necessity, have the toxic waste souping up through the grass. And number two, maintaining grass is a problem with the kind of usage that field takes. And I actually would just like to add to that. There have been a number of schools in the district that have put in second or even third turfs. And I've asked their athletic directors, how did you get the funding for that? Um, and they said that it's actually more cost efficient to have turf um, over the length of time. So it's a huge cost to put it in, but over the 10-year life, um, with a relatively low cost of maintenance annually, they said it's more cost efficient, and so now some schools have two or three turf surfaces. Can I ask a question? Uh, when did Capital decide not to fund it? Two years ago, last year. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, over the last five years, Capital has been systematically <coughs> saying no to everything high school related, unless it was an immediate health and safety factor. And the turf was scheduled to be replaced either last year or this year. It was this year. I believe so. And that's it was on the, the it was on the five year plan for the schedule, right. but then it must have been last year the decision was made by the Capital Budget Committee to not go forward with funding the turf replacement because of the up in the air status of the building rebuilding of the high school. So next time when this happens, could we be have that brought to us? Yeah, we did. We did. I it don't, was mentioned uh, last I year. I don't remember sure I ever it. hearing it. You need, maybe you I, need to tell us a couple that, of times if you did hear it one time because we would, I, I know at least three people, mm -hmm. know, maybe more, who would have taken some action. Yeah. I, I think that, I know, I know we did tell everyone, but I don't think what we didn't know until the testing was done, right. how imminent mm -hmm. the need to do this would be. And while we share the concern that there could be um, a problem with the construction. The thing is that we're still going to be at least three to four years before we're, we're 
putting a shovel in the ground. And I think that we would just have to make sure that if we make the investment now, that we protect that field from any yeah. kind of incursion. We would, we would have to do, be very creative in what we're going to do with the students. <coughs> you can't be creative with the football program or the athletic programs that we have. So the, that field would have to be protected and, and maintain, if we're going to maintain our athletic program. Mm -hmm. it, how long would it take to start to finish? Do you have any idea how long it takes to start to finish? That's a really good question. Um, when I've spoken to a couple of different companies, they alluded to it as a summer project. Mm -hmm. um, so my guess would be anywhere from four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. But I, I could look into that and find out. Do we have any other questions right now? Had, had the field ever been tested in the past? Not to my knowledge. Uh, Rob, do you know if it was tested in the past? Well, somebody must have made some sort of uh, evaluation for capital planning to have, make a, an assessment that there was a need for replacement. Oh, it's just the 10-year life on yeah. turf. Yeah. 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 When that, I that. came in last year, Joe Conley um, had spoken to that. It was up for re renewal um, and replacement, and so had Diane, um, just in terms of the timeline of when it had been put okay. in. We did change the plan of care for the turf this year, and so we increased how frequently it's groomed, which essentially pulls the infill, which will help with the give. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, one oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was saying, I, there can't be no question. Yeah, the, yeah. The point you raised about the directed studies, could you elaborate on that? You're saying that we're not in compliance with state standards, that means that there are some students who have more directed studies than the Laurel? To tell, could you give any? Um, the state standards are a certain number of minutes per year of instructional time. 990 right? hours, right. And we call them directed studies and we treat them as instructional time. Okay. Right? And that is, and th we're not, again, not alone in doing that. Correct. But, um, but it's really a euphemism for study hall. Um, they're, they're not times that are used for for the vast majority of students as anything other than study halls. Um, and so it's not really instructional time. Um, at the same time, the problem with directed studies is, as I said before, so I've got a student who's a freshman, and he's taking for his PE requirement, three and on our rotation right now, three days of PE out of every seven. And three days, uh, and this is true for sophomores, and three days out of every seven, he's in a study hall, which he may not need. Um, now, I could program opposite that PE class um, if I had, but I'd have, if I did it, I mean, we could, for example, put intro to art in that slot. Um, but if I put intro to slot, art in that slot, that's going to take, you know, one and a half PE art teachers yeah, that I don't have. Um, so if I programmed art more efficiently so kids could get more art in their schedule, um, I wouldn't be able to staff it. Um, and the same thing is true, you know, I mean, many seniors want to take they want their one directed study. But they're not supposed to have directed studies in the middle of the day. I didn't count again this year, but last year it was 75 kids, um, juniors and seniors that had directed studies in the middle of the day. when we don't want them to have those. Um, what was the study period? Um, well, it's either 51 minutes or 80 minutes, depending on the day. So if the, if the student wants a study period, you tell them that I will extend your day by 51 minutes, and you can have your study period. Um, right, but the point is they don't have that study period because they want it. They have their study period because there's nothing for them to program. So, I mean, I think to frame it, it's not that the district or the high school isn't in compliance with state standards. It's, it, it means that we're, we're shortchanging some kids because we're not able to offer classes Correct. during those periods. But we're in compliance with state standards. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. So that's important. I want to I'll make say sure. yes. Well, I mean, no, it's, I, it's I mean, a I, Yes, it is yeah. like, as, as some of the other things I said today. Yeah. Um, there are things that we are all challenged by, right? It's right. a challenge across the state, and the state has allowed people to make that decision. It's sort of not quite with the spirit of the law, but it is with the letter of the law in terms of trying to be able to provide kids programming during those times. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yeah. Pierce. You indicated that there are some electives <coughs> that, that are um, not being used mm -hmm. by students. In other words, there are some classes that aren't as full it, there are a multitude of electives that you said in your previous right. talk, right? Mm -hmm. And with a very small number of exceptions, those are all full. So it's not that you can direct some of these directed study students into some of those electives. No, the They're classes are full. I mean, our art class, our art teachers at the moment, I was just looking at that, um, have five sections of 
23 to 25 kids. I have one section of digital photography that has 29 in it. Um, you know, the, we had, um, I can't remember the exact number, but for the five slots of cooking, which we can put 100 kids into because um, we can only fit 20 kids into the cooking lab without somebody falling in the stove, um, there were, I want to say 180 kids that wanted it. Bar I'm sorry to keep going. Right. Barring the physical limitations of some programs like cooking or, or art, mm -hmm. there's got to be some electives where instead of 23 students, there could be 28, and you could get some of those students out of directed study and without putting in a new FTE, right? I mean, sure, you'd be increasing class size, but we have the... Well, we have, you know, I mean, we have tried to cap the class size, yes. I mean, if we could, but if you put 28 kids... I mean, first of all, I, I, I believe we have it at some elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our contract cap, you got it. You must no, know this, Lynn. Is it 125 for a teacher load? Well, they're not. It's okay. It's just um, suggested. Okay, there's no requirement. Um, you know, but if you put a teacher, just 25 kids in a class for five classes, you got a teacher who's now responsible for 125 students, <laughs> plus an advisory, plus a directed study that they're likely to be supervising. Um, we try to cap the classes at 25. And sometimes we beg, borrow, and steal him like that, you know, digital photography class. Um, he has not got enough stations for 29 kids, but they make do. Um, but um, how do I say this? So we do squeeze kids into those programs. I mean, memoir, I think memoir poetry has 29 and 27 in the two sections. Those are English classes writing heavy when an English teacher signs an essay and spends five minutes grading every single one of those papers. It's an awful long time outside of school to give the kids feedback. Um, so it really, I mean, it depends on the classes. Um, so we're squeezing the kids in there and we will squeeze the kids in there. We're not asking right now for more than, you know, what we're looking for right now is, you know, a small number of sections to accommodate the rising enrollment, not to accommodate breaking out. But if we were to fill in the gaps, um, you know, it's so that we weren't busting at the seams in all those electives. It would be f three or four more FTE just to fill that in. That actually gets to kind of my question, which I have two. One is, would it be possible to get <coughs> uh, <coughs> numbers of directed studies per <coughs> grade? Um, we've had this in the past, and it's helpful, and it'd be helpful to see how it's changed over time. Um, th it was before you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then also... I mean, I will say this. It's better. I mean, last year, thank you, you gave us six FTE. Right? And last year, we added a number of electives. Um, and by all accounts, we had a much better and a much smoother enrollment this year in the fall. And it was much easier for kids to get in. I mean, that's the thing. It makes a difference in terms of kids being able to get in the programming they wanted and the schedules they wanted. Um, and so it makes a difference. Even small differences make a big difference. Um, so, and what, so what you're asking for then, I mean, I can certainly produce this, what you're asking for is, because it's merely juniors and seniors you'd be looking at, is the number of directed studies, right? No, actually, the freshmen and sophomores, well, the too. The freshmen I and sophomores, know, they're all on directed studies. Right, and, and I just want numbers. I want to know, okay, I mean, just for so each I class. can say. Do you want yeah, that over time class. or just for this year? Um, if you have it over time, that uh, you don't have to go very far back because we've gotten, mm -hmm. when did we have it from 2010, Well, if you've got 2011? it, can you send it to me? I'd like to see it myself. Anyway, I can, I can find what we've got. Um, but then the other question is just how many FT would it take to get kids out of these directed studies? And I'm not saying I have that magic money somewhere to pay for them, but I'd just like to know. Mm. Roughly because three or four, depending on how we did it. Right, it's just, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you and I've done much. the math many times in the back of an envelope, and mm -hmm. depending on how I do the math, I come up with three or four. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Ruggieri? Do, do you need the ACM? And, is it error rate? And Hello. Good evening. So I'm by myself. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, parent-teacher conferences tonight, so the Stand. assistant principals are all at the school. I stayed there for the first hour or so, and things seem to be going pretty well, so I was able to sneak out. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking you for, for having us, well, 
my department chairs, myself, uh, some of the department chairs came for some support. So I'm going to be asking for some, some help for, the, for them. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you for all the additional staffing that you did give us for this year. Um, it has been very helpful already. We've seen some successes. And I'm going to be looking down once in a while. Uh, I forgot my glasses. So okay. it, I may be down there a little bit longer just till, till things focus. Um, but the successes that we have, and we back up and we look at um, the growth. Our enrollment growth is still up there. Um, we keep getting bigger because more and more people want to live in Arlington and they're leaving other districts. So I go to meetings with principals um, and I see their schools are getting smaller where ours is getting larger. So I think when I got here, we were about probably the seventh or eighth largest middle school in the state. We're around four or five right now. Uh, and we're continuing to get bigger and bigger. Um, so, uh, and I know you know that. So I want to review what happened this year with, with the clusters um, to that sixth grade cluster that you gave us was very helpful. But I want to back up a little bit. At the end of my first year, we had to cut uh, 10 positions. And I say this all the time because we're still a little bit behind. Uh, we were just over, I think just over, if, if not just around 1,000 students when I, when I started at Audison six years ago. Um, now we're at 1140, somewhere in that area. Um, so that's quite a growth over the time that I've been here. When I first arrived at Audison, we have four sixth grade clusters. And cluster sizes were right around 100, um, as they are again. But then for four years, we had three clusters. So in that time, the teachers were getting really burnt out. They were getting stressed. This year, it's like a Walt Disney film up on the sixth grade floor. Everybody's happy. You know, people are relaxed. <laughs> you know, there's butterflies and bluebirds, and it's, it's really something else, the kids. And so what happens is the, it, it allowed us to keep the, the clusters at just under 100 students, uh, which is really a great, um, you know, thing for the teachers because then they're able to get to know the students better. And it really helps with the advisory program, too, because now you have, not only do you have the 99, 98, 99 students with their teachers and they're getting to know them very well and they're doing a lot of team building, but then you break it down, you also have that advisory period once a week. So now, overall, teachers have smaller advisories and are better able to get to know the students. And with the house system, now you have the assistant principal that's right there on the floor running their own uh, cluster or team meetings and uh, learning team meetings and they're better able to get to what the student issues are earlier so now we're able to identify uh, issues with students earlier because the groups are smaller so that the teachers can see them more so it's this like ripple effect and it also helps with cluster meetings with parents because parents are able to get in more frequently so if you have 134 students in, in, a, in a cluster and you have 40 or 50 parents that you need to see, that's an awful lot of cluster meetings. So now the teachers are tired. They're, they're grading more. They're having trouble getting all the parents they need to get in there because they don't have enough cluster time. Well, this really helps that because now we have more time to get parents in. We have more time uh, and we can get more parents in because we have more teachers. Um, and so really overall, the staff feels less overwhelmed. They feel more balanced. Um, they feel as if, as if they're more effective. They, they felt pretty beaten down the last few years, and I can tell you how they're just so thankful that you were able to do this for them. Uh, it really meant a lot, and I'm sure that if you've seen them, they probably told you that. Um, but it's, it's really made a huge difference, and I hope that we can see, you know, at the end of the year, a lot of some concrete differences that it's, that it's made, and uh, I'll be reporting back on those. Um, and it's also specifically beneficial when teaching certain subject areas, math, you know, reading. One of the things we identified uh, in the sixth grade uh, MCAS scores were writing was an issue because students weren't reading the way they were supposed to be reading. So after talking to Deb Perry, we'd, we've really beefed up reading across the curriculum in all three grades, but specifically in grade six. So when it comes to something like reading, it's really beneficial to have smaller English classes so that we can do a better job of teaching reading, writing, math. And then, you know, I know that sounds like a logical thing, but I just think it's something that needs to be pointed out. 
And we also thank you for the part time specialists that we got, that we were able to get this year. Um, now that's a twofold thing. It's, a, it's good, but because we looked at the cluster and said, all right, well, the kids have to go somewhere, the students have to go somewhere when they're outside a cluster. And when we started to build the schedule, we realized that we we're going to be short staffed in some areas, and there's going to be some imbalances uh, in foreign language, PE, tech, fax, um, what am I leaving out, uh, art, music, digital modeling. So we added things in, and they were very helpful. But because we added them in as late as we did, because we knew we needed the cluster, and that was the main thing that we needed to ask for, but because we added them in later, they were helpful, but when you back up a, a tech class that now you have a .6 extra tech teacher, but you have 2.2 or 2.4 fax teachers, now that's, in, that's an imbalance. So when you're trying to schedule a sixth grade student who now has to choose a foreign language, so they have to choose Mandarin, say they're in Mandarin, and they're in tech and they're in fax, the way it all shakes out is you may have a Mandarin class of eight, a tech class of 32, a fax class of 12, and, you know, a PE class of 38. So the, because of the way that the, the specialists were added, um, that, made, that, that created an imbalance in the specialists. So we started the schedule for next year already. We started, I started working on it over a month ago with the department chair. So I have all the numbers for next year already. Uh, and, we're, and we're putting those together, and I'm hoping to do a dry run of the schedule within the next week or two. So the numbers that I'm showing you tonight are the closest I have to what I believe will help alleviate that imbalance from last year. I'm hoping that the numbers I have right now will alleviate those imbalances <laughs> uh, with foreign language and tech and facts that, and art and music, because those classes are still very large, even with the added on. And whenever you talk about an average class, especially at the middle school, because it's so tightly scheduled, and I will talk a little bit about the schedule, too, and where we are with that. Um, if you say that there's an average class of, say, 21, then that means there could be classes of 26, 27, and 28, and classes of 13, 14, 15, 16. If you say your average class is 26 or 27, then you could have a possibility of, average, of class sizes of 32, 33, 17, 18, 19. So that's, you know, that's really another thing that helped with the, with the, the fourth cluster, uh, but not so much with the specialists. Um, and as I said, as our enrollment grows, the, our ability to maneuver within the schedule that we have is really difficult. Um, as a lot of the things that, um, that Matt said or similar with us, but it's different because I'm not saying this because I do it, but middle school schedules are the hardest schedules to do because of the constraints that are on them. And I know a lot of you up there know that because we, you know, have been, as our enrollment goes, grows, we've been struggling with what we're going to do. So as we add these staff members, it'll add the sections that we need, then space becomes an issue. So that's something else that we have to look at. But when you look at students now, the schedules are so tight and we, have, we don't have enough sections that some students are having to forego taking classes. So a student may not be able to take art because of certain situations in their schedule. There's only so much room in their schedule or so many sections of art. So a student really needs to take a class that is held at the same time of art. We have a limited number of sections of art. so that student can't take art in a different place. So again, that's what Matt was saying about directed studies. So it's the same exact situation, <coughs> but in a middle school manner at the middle school, where we're not able to run, say, 1B, when orchestra and band and chorus are in, we're not able to run an art class or a music class or a fax class or a tech class at that time, A, because we don't have the staffing, well, A, because we don't have the staffing. Um, and B, I was going to say because we don't have the space, but we could probably find space at this point because I think we're going to be okay, um, sort of. Um, but, um, you know, it, that, that's the problem, and that's why we really need to have, um, to have these extras because, you know, what we're trying to do is, is bring equity 
you know, that's our real, that's our data focus this year too at the school, is bringing equity to the students. You know, we're looking at a lot of different things. So, so we really want equity to be the center of everything we do. You know, that's, that's our hope this year. And when I talked to uh, Kathy yesterday and my administrative team, that was really one of the things that we, we really <coughs> want to see happen. And to do that, we need to be able to add these positions um, that I'm going to be talking about later. But at the same time, I'm really thanking you for the, for the um, positions that you already added. Because I'll tell you, as Matt and I'm sure special education, we really do well. Our school really does well. I did a pre presentation the other night on MCAS, the advisory program, the house system, and you know uh, how we're rethinking what we might 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 be doing with some of the programs at the school. And um, you know, I sat there and I said, we've been able to do a tremendous amount in the last five plus years. And I was really proud of looking at the at the scores and how how they've gone up. You know, because we have a habit, all of us, because we serve the public of of beating ourselves up because we want to do the best that we can do. But every once in a while, it's okay to take a minute and say, hey, you know what? We've really done some special things here. So we want to continue to do those special things. But unless we can continue to grow with our enrollment, we're not going to be able to do those things. Um, one of the other things uh, that was really positive this year, as well as the, the extras in um, the specials and the cluster was, because we had extra technology teachers and because we had so many uh, grants uh, from AEF or so much grant money from the AEF, we did win the Mass Tech Award this year, as you know, um, which was a huge coup for us, uh, but well deserved. Uh, they were blown away by everything <coughs> we were able to do. So I'd like to just take the, the time right now to thank the town and the AEF for that. That's something else that was uh, a huge accomplishment. So that's why, again, we want to see things like that continue to develop. So for 2000, um, 2015, 2016, our hope is that now that we have that fourth cluster, please can we keep it. Um, uh, we are going from 397 students to roughly 405 students. So that's not that much of a, a, a jump, you know, there will be more. So I, I would hope that with a year under their belt with four clusters now that the sixth grade students will have a better experience next year than they, they had this year because every year we try to improve, we do improve the transition and every year we try to do earlier interventions uh, with students. Um, grade 7 is currently 342 students and it will increase to 397. So this is a 55 <coughs> student increase. Um, so what we'd like to do in there is not ask for a whole cluster in 7th grade. What we'd like to do is ask for a half cluster. So if we had two teachers that were duly certified, so a teacher that was certified in humanities, ELA and history, social studies, and another teacher that was certified in math and science, and they are out there. Um, I had in a previous district, uh, there was a school that had uh, the same exact setup. Uh, we would be able to take roughly 60 or 70 students, put them with the half cluster, and uh, we'd have an average class size in grade seven of 21 students. Again, average in terms of middle school where a teacher could have a class of six, 17 and then a class of 25 or 26. If we don't have that, we're going to have af average class size of 26, 27, somewhere in there. So that would mean that cluster sizes are larger. Now that the sixth grade students who have had all this personalized instruction, uh, this great experience in grade six, now they go to grade seven, they don't have the half cluster, it's all for naught. And well, I shouldn't say all for naught, but it's gonna be more difficult, more difficult for the students, and more difficult for the teachers. Again, as Dr. Janger was saying earlier, we're getting an awful lot out of our teachers and an awful lot out of our students, but at some point in time, it's gonna break. And I know you know that, and I know that you're just, you just need information so that you can take it to the next level and, and really help us. Um, so our hope after that for the 2016-2017 year, um, which I can't believe it is not that far away at all, is to build on to that half cluster, so to add two teachers to that. So we'd look at that, uh, that half cluster and say, okay, we want to add a math and an ELA teacher to that because this person's strength is really social studies and that person's strength is really science. So, um, you know, we would hope that that would be, and then what would happen there is that 
now full cluster would be split between seven and eight. So they'd have 60 or whatever the number is, you know, whatever the number of the incoming class would be. So it would be 405 and 397 at that point. So they'd have 50 seventh graders and, or 60 seventh graders and 40 eighth graders. So they'd split the class. They'd have three seventh grade classes and two eighth grade classes. And that would minimize the numbers. And that would keep the numbers probably around 22, 23 average, which is still very reasonable. And again, that number, I haven't, Really, the 21 and 27, I've calculated that. The 22, 23 is more of an educated guess. Um, so what I'm really asking for for next year, uh, and I will get to space a, a, a little bit later, but for <coughs> cluster teachers um, would be the 2.0, so for the half cluster in grade 7. Um, in order to balance out... Um, all the specials, I would need those below, and I'll, I'll go through those. Um, so if we had added a 0.6 fax and a 0.4 technology, fax and technology run back to back. So if we were at, to add a 0.6, uh, a 0.4 technology class, then we could have a grade 6 technology teacher, a grade 7 technology teacher, and a grade 8 technology teacher, or a grade 6 technology teacher and then a 7 and 8, they could split 7 and 8. However, you know, uh, Mr. Weathers and, and Brandy and Gary think would be the best way to break that up. But it, it, I think it would be great to have a, a technology teacher that solely did grade <laughs> six. Again, really trying to personalize their experience. Well, that runs back to back with facts. So if you have balanced technology numbers, now you're going to have imbalanced facts numbers. And the facts numbers are large anyway, the family and consumer science. So we'd need a 0.4 fax to balance that out. So because they run back to back, you'd have far larger fax classes than you do technology classes. Uh, and by going to 1.0 uh, technology, you are now reducing digital modeling. So what would happen there is there would not be enough staffing to have digital modeling for the sixth grade. We, because that, that staff member that is teaching <coughs> digital modeling would be moving to 1.0 tech. So we need to fill that position so that we could keep the uh, digital modeling numbers, which will be fine because, again, we're only increasing by anywhere from 5 to 10 students next year. Um, so that would keep that um, copacetic. Uh, and art, we would need to add, we have a 0.2 right now. We'd need to add, bring it up to a 0.4. So that I should have had a 0.2 art there, um, 0.4 PE and 0.4 ACE. All those classes are, they're tough to balance as well. We need to create more sections uh, of these classes and we can run them during times during the day when other things are happening. So for instance, we were talking about the directed studies and a, a good creative way of using directed study time would be if we had extra sessions to be able to build them into those times. Um, also, what the um, special education department and Matt Janger were talking about earlier really helps me as well because I, we need a regular education social worker for next year. Um, we, were, we were talking about the interventions that we try to put in place for students and get to them as early as possible. If we were to have, take one of my social workers now that's a regular education <coughs> guidance slash social worker and take that social worker and go from 0.5 to 1.0 and then have that social worker work primarily with the new intervention program that we're building. We're, model, we're attempting to model an intervention program after the, um, the high school's intervention program to deal with students that have been hospitalized that are coming back into district uh, or students that are going out and being hospitalized. We don't have an intervention program for them right now, so a lot of that uh, from time to time turns into school refusal. The students aren't as successful. So I've been working with Mr. Flood, Ms. Murphy, and Ms. Salvatore, my three assistant principals, and I've been working with guidance and the high school and been having meetings on how to build a transition program, not by asking for anything, but by you know, doing it with what we have with the hopes that next year we could build in a .5 social worker. Um, also, this year, we, uh, last year we had 1,104 students um, and we had one nurse. This year, because of a grant, we have two nurses. Uh, I was talking to um, some of the nurses and they were saying that the grant may not be in existence next year. 
which would mean we'd be back down to one nurse with 1,140 students. Um, <coughs> that just isn't feasible. So we're asking um, you if um, you could impress upon those who listen to you uh, that we ha would have one nurse um, if the grant isn't renewed. So at some point in time, the grant is going to run out, and it may be next year. So we're really going to need um, another nurse. The, the next thing that I would like to talk about, and then that will um, be the end of, of my presentation, will be space. So again, Ma Maureen Murphy, myself, uh, Jack Flood, Wendy Salvatore, we sit down, we're like, oh, this is great. We, we know what we need for staff. And then Maureen, without missing it a beat, will say, all right, now where are we going to put them? And, and it's true. So what we've been doing is we've been going around the building and we've been looking at space that we can split and talking to, you know, Kathy and Diane last year because we didn't really need the space uh, as much as we knew we'd need it in the future. We put off dividing some of the rooms because of the cost. So Diane was saying that it would be better to put that money into other areas for now instead of spending the money to split these rooms, which wouldn't be cost effective. And then this year, now I understand, what, and I understand why they did it now, then, but I understand better now because we really are up against it. So we're looking at splitting some of the classrooms, and, and the problem was that the ventilation was an issue. Um, but we can do it, it's just going to cost to do it. Uh, we also are looking at some of our programs in the building that, have, that don't have as big a numbers as uh, other programs and combining room space. So we're, gonna, we're hoping to add rooms that way. We also have two computer labs that we're hoping to go mobile with. Um, we work, we're moving away from PCs, um, and so we're, we're going to be moving those out of the, of, the, of the labs at some point in time. So we're hoping to go mobile um, and use those labs potentially for foreign language teachers um, and also for, uh, we could use it for the half cluster. Uh, also, talking about foreign language, I, I did leave one thing out. We, I ran the numbers with uh, Catherine Rich yesterday afternoon, and this has already made its way over. So I know that our, our Spanish numbers are going up as well. So we're going to have very large Spanish classes for next year. So I was hoping that at some point in time I might be able to speak about adding possibly a point four to Spanish, a point two or a point four there uh, to, to help those numbers. And, and I, I feel kind of greedy asking for this stuff, but it's not, it's really what we need. Um, I, I, we're trying to be as, as frugal as possible, but this is, the, we're, we're really up against it. And I was talking to one of the guidance counselors tonight at the beginning of, um, of uh, the parent-teacher conferences, and he said, you know, if we keep this up, we're going to be bigger than the high school. I know that sounds funny because there are four classes there, but, you know, this is just getting out of control in a good way. You know, because we're growing, which means the town is successful, which means people like it here, and that's a wonderful thing. But we really are going to need space. 2016, 2017 is going to be very difficult, challenging, uh, and we're going to need some more space um, in the school. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the time. Questions from the committee? Um, yeah, I was just confused. You, you, you kept mentioning equity, and I, I think I was just sort of missed something. Equity across... Well, if we are able to balance out our classes better. Uh, oh, class, so, class sizes. So class okay. sizes is one thing. You know, we're talking about doing, you know, there's a lot of different uh, data uh, points that we're looking at this year. And one of the, the focuses that we're looking on is whatever data we're looking at, we want equity for the students in all areas. So if we're looking at homework, is there equity for homework? Which okay. I'm not going to, okay. that will open up a whole other discussion. But when we were talking about equity as far as, we're, in this particular instance, it was it was class sizes. So, and and I know you don't want to do this, of course, but um, but suppose you could only get half of what you wanted, would there be a prioritized list? I mean, um, I'm an optimist, so I believe we're going to be able to do it. But y yes, I, I mean, I have to talk to the superintendent, uh, assistant superintendent, business manager, uh, human resource director, my assistant principals, but we'd be able to come up with uh, mm -hmm. some sort of a prioritized list. Okay. One question at a time. Um, on the half cluster, mm -hmm. um, I've got a lot of experience with that. Uh, I, 
it works on one level, but I've not really found the teachers who do really, really well on both content areas. Right. Uh, so my calculus is, in, in terms of looking at priorities, would I rather have the half cluster and have 75 <coughs> kids uh, taking the classes with a teacher who's stronger in one area than another, or would I rather have higher class sizes with a strong science teacher and a strong math teacher and a strong ELA teacher and a strong social studies teacher? So that's one of those priority things that I'm thinking at. That if I'm looking at, I'm just going from my gut opinion as a result of the presentation. So the question that I would want to hear an answer for, and it's not for tonight, it's for between now and March when we finalize the budget, would be, are we going to maintain the quality of instruction on a half cluster in a manner that was better than having, uh, 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 not having the half cluster and having everybody with a strong <coughs> teacher in that particular content area. So understand that, that I'm looking at that balance. The second, so, so I'm not expecting an answer to that now because that's a tough thing to answer. And we have asked that, so. Yeah, yeah. The second thing that you're talking about is in terms of the balance of the schedule, in terms of an average class size of 23 could be 33 and 13. Um, what thoughts have you had in terms of breaking paradigms or changing the way the structure, the schedule is structured in order to balance out the numbers? Well, I'm meeting with principals from other middle schools mm -hmm. and looking at their schedules and seeing if there are uh, <coughs> possibilities of how we could redo the schedule. So we are looking at other schedules from schools that are like-sized. Mm -hmm. uh, and. The funny thing is, the, the few a couple of the principals that I met said, ooh, I like your schedule. Mm -hmm. you know, so they were, I ended up going and meeting with two principals, and they both wanted to adopt our schedule, and I didn't like either of theirs. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we are looking around, and, and we did contemplate uh, going into a junior high model uh, at one point, which would make it easier to schedule, but we really believe in the philosophy of a middle school model, and I don't want to go away from that. Um, it really makes it a more special experience for the students. And again, going to the house system and still having the clusters, it really personalizes it, and I'd hate to have to do that. Mm -hmm. So we really are looking into to how we're gonna redo the schedule. And I hope that by starting as early as we have, when we do the first run, that'll really give us an idea of, if we have to think outside of what we're doing right now. Okay, now for the uh, P word, portables. Mm. Um, if we're looking, you know, I, I don't know where the trends are going. All I know is that right now, at this point in time, they look to be increasing. Mm -hmm. And that you can see for the future for a year or two where you can divide rooms and move things around and go for a little efficiency and get the uh, old la desktops out of the computer labs and convert them to classrooms and, and, and teach on the stage or do whatever other little uh, Band-Aid you do. When do we get to the point where it's broken to the point where we really need to do something s substantive like add square footage? I think the year after next, we're going to need to decide what we're going to do the following year. So 2017, 2018, I think. Uh, Kathy, I don't know if you wanted to talk to that at all about what we might be doing the year after next for space. Actually, we're developing a plan. I honestly would rather talk about this with the facilities committee mm -hmm. rather than right now, but... Um, a plan is developing. Because the question is, I, I've, I've been through, you, you know this building. Uh, I assume that you've taken the same kind of tour that we have. Yes. And we've got these whack, wacky divided rooms that are divided uh, uh, in, 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 to make a triangle and pillars in the middle of everything. And that, that we've done bad things to create more classrooms that no matter what we do, we're stuck with them until we get the SBAB in there to come and tear down those walls and every other wall surrounding it. So my, I, on a long-term thing, my real concern is, is that, if we, that we're not going to end up doing something in terms of division rooms now that's only a <coughs> stopgap measure that we're going to have to address later and end up with a permanent situation of a badly divided room. 
So you understand what, you know, my anxiety on this. Mine as well. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be dealing with that facility. Yeah. But uh, it, it, I, we, we, hear, we hear you. We, we understand this. We've been talking about this a lot and convey to your staff that this is uh, one of those things that we worry about every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was also questioning about the, or have questions about the half cluster. I'm just trying to figure out their schedule in my head and if they've got 60 to 70 students and two people, albeit they can each teach two subjects, you're still, if everybody in the, everyone has to be scheduled in cluster at the same time, you're going to end up with classes of 30 to 35 <coughs> because there's only two people. And I'm not saying that's going to happen for every, it, it, I, well, I'm worried it, that it can take the, off the half people. cluster wouldn't be scheduled the same. That's one of the issues as well, you know, Mr. Slickman pointed out, there are difficulties with half clusters. I mean, how do they have cluster time? You know, um, <coughs> who are they connected to when they're not with their teachers? They're meeting at different times. Yeah, so that half cluster can't meet with their content areas. You know, so there are issues that we have to work through with this. Um, and the scheduling, the scheduling them will be different. Uh, mm -hmm. The way their schedule will be different. The way the students' schedules are done will be different and how they go to specials. So these are all things that we, again, have to look at. Um, okay. Between, mm -hmm. uh, and then I wanted to make one comment to Mr. Schlickman's concern about whether it's better to have bigger classes and higher quality teachers. Um, my child went through that um, in sixth grade and in seventh and it, she's one of the ones in the big the big cluster that's going ahead and it's less than optimal um there <coughs> even though the teachers are great there is a limit to how much time they have in the day just the same mm -hmm. limit that the rest mm -hmm. of us do and the interactions with the students diminishes just because they don't have that much time and so i think I, I think there is mm -hmm. a trade-off, and, and it's something I would, I mean, you know, it depends how much mm -hmm. less optimal the person mm -hmm. is, but I, I think it's worth, definitely worth considering. Well, I and mean, that's another thing that we were talking about with balance. So if we were to go to the split cluster this year, then we would be, wouldn't be able to ask for as much with the specialists to, to balance that. So that's why we decided that we would go with the half cluster <coughs> and beef up the specialists and then add that other uh, piece on the following year. So, thank you. I have mm. just one intro. Kim, I'm going to stick it with you, but it goes for all of them. I, in order to make an informed decision, would like to see the cost of staff and related materials, space changes in buildings. That oh, that re you reminds me, I, it's going to add on to that. Yeah. Just, just mm -hmm. say, for all that comes <coughs> forward, yeah. uh, with a, all the requests, what it would cost. And I guess I would ask you and to Dr. Bodie to the other principals and stuff, if you don't get it, the impact mm -hmm. you know, that we know the backward. I don't think everybody's going to get everything they want, but I think we need to understand in our decision making the impact of what, again, for a better phrase, the priority list, but at, at the different uh, levels. I have, a, I have a lot of faith in you, Mr. Hanna, so. <laughs> so I wish we'll be I able to do it. Care. So, but that was one thing I left out were desks, you know, chairs, materials, materials. Right. So that was one of the things. Having a teacher has a ripple effect through the budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Well, I'm okay. fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Moving on to the uh, monthly financial, Ms. Johnson. Um, yes, thank you. Um, we are continuing along. There have been no drastic changes um, or swings, and we're still very early in the heating season. So, so. any members oh. have any questions, Ms. Johnson? Uh, I do. Sorry, I'm sorry. Ahead. I, you jumped too fast. I have to find you want my. Me to go first, then. Yeah, you go first. Okay. Can you give me? Uh, and, and you may not have the numbers with you right now. Cost uh, expenditure on gas last year and the previous year? It is, if you go <coughs> to the budget, 
um, it would be under, um, I assume you were talking about natural heating gas as opposed yeah, well, to fuel. Yeah, the one that you're anticipating. Uh, under, 82104. I think so. It, it, it's, it's account code 82104. And what you see here is that we have a budget line of just under seven hundred thousand right. dollars. But right now, based on our last year's last several years of gas expenditures, we've encumbered as much as we have typically spent. So that's okay. that's so where that's that's why we're estimating that savings. Okay. And I didn't want to I know we've been over budgeted in this line for a while, but I wanted to have at least one full season on the Thompson before right. I have, any cuts there. I did so this six ninety six hundred and ninety six is what we've been budgeting for the past couple of years. Yes. Okay. But have we seen this much? Uh, last year, did we expend most of it? We expend, I mean, the encumbrance amount that you see, the combination of the 31 that's been spent and the 308 that's encumbered. Right. That's for this year. I'm, I'm talking about. But that's based on prior years. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's, that's how we come up with our encumbrance because, number for the year. We project what we expect to spend in that line. We're concerned with is that right now we're showing many lines over mm -hmm. no we and, got, and we, no lines under really just a couple of lines under but the right now we're looking at close to five hundred thousand dollars over yes mm -hmm. if all of a sudden we have massive cold mm -hmm. we're going to be hurting even that much more if we expend with all this gas am i well the likelihood of us expending all the gas money in the budget I think is tolerably remote based on our last several years of expenditures but I just didn't want to lower the budget until I had a full <coughs> season on the Thompson okay. and last year I just didn't have that um, one of the question that I had on the revolving revenue tracking mm -hmm. sheet, the yeah, the dates are wrong at the top I didn't change those well, I apologize that's okay uh, the Bishop bus is looking at uh, a plus of two thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars that's a fee Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, does it go back or? or? No, no. Um, we, we, I estimate how many kids are going to pay for the bus each year for the bishop. And some years it's over and some years it's under, but we try to keep the estimate close. And that's pretty close. So? So we use the entire amount that we collect in any given year to offset the cost of a bus driver. We've, uh, just for my, we've received two, 22000 Yes. And $17. Yes. We're expecting to spend twenty thousand. No, we're expecting to spend twenty two oh seventeen. I will then, spend all of what I collect in a given year, just like I do with athletic then, fees. Then why are we showing uh, estimating over budget? It because implied, when I but when I did the budget last year, my estimated revenues in that line were twenty thousand dollars, and so we have more people riding the bus and paying fees okay. well, than okay. I anticipated. So. I'm interpreting that under the variance that we're going to have $2,000 cash at the end of the year in our pocket. We're not. Uh, yes, it will offset the general fund to the tune of the additional $2,017. I will. What I do with that revolving line is that I move a bus driver's expense out of the general fund and into that revolving line to effectively use up the money so that in any given year those fees that are collected are expensed on a transportation expense. Then I think I know the answer. And I think we're not going to make a profit on this. We never do. Thank the you. cost of the that's, Bishop bus far exceeds the fees. The bottom that's what, yes. that's yes. what the bus costs more than. The bus costs that's far more. Much more than however much we collect, it offsets yes. it however just, much we collect. Right. Fine. Okay. It just the way this was done. It looked it's, like we. It had, can be confusing. Thank you. Okay. Go right ahead. I found out why I couldn't find my question because it was on natural gas, and Mr. Hainer apparently stole it out of my computer and well, asked exactly not. what I wanted to do. And, right. Um, so. Yeah, I had exactly the same concern. So yeah, no, and, and I have too, but I've, I've been, as I say, hesitant to, to do anything until I saw a full year of the Thompson in case there were bugs or shakeouts or it wasn't nearly as energy efficient as we were promised it would be. Okay. Yes. How did the teacher moving budget get so out of whack? That's not particularly out of whack. I've never really budgeted for it. Uh, you know, it's one of those expenses that that's kind of comes out in the wash. Mm -hmm. We, you know, and I don't have a really good metric for figuring out in advance how many people we're going to move. Now, when we move the Stratton, that's going to be a really big number, and I'm going to work harder on figuring out a metric to predict how many people will move. But in you know Mar January, February, when I'm creating the budget, I have no idea how many classrooms are going to get shuffled over the summer. And that's fundamentally where this, this number comes from, is when teachers get shuffled over the summer. 
Okay. So it's just, it, I have no idea how to get a handle on it. I mean, I could, I could do better at putting in the, the average of the last several years, but it's so year specific. Mm -hmm. You know, when we did the Thompson, those expenses were expense to the Thompson building project mm -hmm. because it was related. Mm -hmm. But when we're just moving people around to make them fit, and as we have more kids, we're moving more people more often to make things fit. Well, why does that cost? That's what... The teachers receive a compensation for moving their classroom. And, you know, if an unfortunate teacher gets moved every year, Okay. Thank Anything you. further? Thank you. Uh, moving down to uh, sep uh, consent agenda. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, did I skip something? Yes, superintendent. Uh, superintendent. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Freudian. <laughs> wow. That's, dude, we should explore that. <laughs> With the That's new psychologist. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually, I don't really have much of a report tonight, That's but I do have one thing, and that is wow. to... <laughs> To congratulate the girls' soccer team. Um, as you may know, they went to states this year, and I think this is the first time in 22 years we've had a team go to states. But what's an enormous accomplishment, which is that they, they were the Division II North winners, and they're in a very competitive league, and they did an extraordinarily great job this year. So congratulations to them, the, the final match with Hingham was a nail biter, uh, basically tied until the last minute of the game. And unfortunately, um, we, we were not the team that, that got the last goal. Uh, we also, it's, it's generated a lot of um, team spirit. One of the things uh, that um, our athletic director, Ms. Dudalecki, has been emphasizing is whole school team spirit and how that manifests this year is teams going to other teams' games and they all go to at least one or two. And the cheerleaders went to the States, not to mention the fact we had two busloads of fans go. Um, but then the, the girls' soccer team the following Sunday went to the, the cheerleaders' competition. So there's a lot of that that's been happening this year, which I think has been um, a great team, high school spirit um, incentive. So anyway, congratulations to them. <coughs> that, yes. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 15066, dated uh, November 20th, 2014. Total warrant amount $961,815.70. Approval of draft minutes October 9th, 2014. November 13th, 2014. November 20th, 2014. I want to pull the warrant. The warrant itself? Yeah. Okay. I'm pulling the 20th, but I don't I couldn't find the minutes of the 20th in here, but no? but I could I could be missing them. No, okay. okay. Uh, but anyway, I wasn't here on the 20th. So, so right now, uh, we will approve. Oh, I have, yeah, I'm, I also wasn't warrant, I mean, uh, draft minutes for October 9th, 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're there, the 20th of that. Just November 13th, 2014. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? We'll now move on to uh, approval of draft minutes November 20th, 2014. All those approved? Please just raise your hand for the secretary. Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Okay. Moving on to the warrant uh, article. Yes. You're in it. Okay. Thank you very much. I will be abstaining in that there is an item of reimbursement from uh, going down to the uh, MASC uh, conference. All those in favor of the warrant as presented, raise your hands again, please. Opposed? Abstention? Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to subcommittees. Uh, policy. Thank you. We had a, a meeting uh, just yesterday um, to go over policies and um, student discipline policies, the uh, agenda uh, that was um, Listed. That's not on for second read tonight, is it? First read. First read. The agenda policy? No. No. I didn't see that last 
Do we approve agenda? Yeah, uh, we. We approved it. We did. Yeah, as amended. As, am we, as amended. Oh, that's right. That's right. So on for first read tonight, we have the Domestic Violence Leave Act. This was uh, in August, the legislature passed this act, which requires all employers with 50 or more employees to pro provide work leave to victims of domestic violence. Uh, we worked off a model that uh, the Mass Association of School Committees had written a sample, um, and it was um, given to uh, our legal counsel to look at, which was suggested uh, by MASC to pass it by legal counsel and we discussed the merits and and we would recommend this uh, uh, for, for adoption at our next meeting um, that's all we have yeah. um, so I understand that you're working off a model and stuff but and that it comes down from law but when I'm reading it it doesn't actually if the person has suffered domestic violence and is recovering from an injury or is caring for a person recovering from injury, that's not covered as the thing is written. And it just seems to me that that would be a natural thing to include in this. Um, and again, I realize that. What part are you looking at? I'm, I'm talking about the, in order to be <coughs> eligible for said leave, and it talks about the employee must be using the leave from work too, and it talks about things, but it doesn't actually include recovering from injury or caring for a person recovering from injury. And I just wondered about that. Well, in, in paragraph one, it says a family member of the employee. Right, right, right. but I'm saying that the employee, in paragraph two, right. it says the employee must be using the leave from work to, to seek or obtain medical attention, counseling, victim services, or legal assistance, secure housing, obtain a protective order from court, appear in court or before a grand jury, meet with a district attorney or other law enforcement official, or attend child custody proceedings, or address other issues directly related to the abusive behavior <coughs> against the employee or family member. And I'm saying Recovering from injury can take time, or can, and or if a child or someone is recovering from injury, that takes caring for them takes time, and right. that doesn't actually look like it's covered. Yeah, I would say that um, the language that it says that the employee must be using the leave from work to seek or obtain medical attention, if the medical uh, opinion is that the employee needs time off from work to recover from injury, that would I think that would fall under this, and it would um, qualify for the 15 days of domestic violence leave. It may also qualify for the employee's use of sick leave or other FMLA right. or something else right. that could be sort of combined at the same time, could run concurrently. Oh. So it, it's not, it, it, it wouldn't um, mean that they couldn't use those things. It's really up to whether the situation calls for the use of those other types of leave. Okay. I I guess that's kind of, to me, that's kind of a generous reading of obtaining medical attention, but if you think that's how it would. Well, I mean, I think. Do, do people understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I, did, was there a consultation with uh, MASC on this particular one? Not with uh, Mr. Finnegan, but with, okay. um, uh, with uh, Deutsch attorneys Williams. at Deutsch Williams, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we, we talked about whether the leave shall run concurrently or consecutively. And we determined that it was going to be a case-by-case -case basis. And the employer, the, the district, has the right to either provide pay or, or, or to ask for the employee to use the sick or vacation in addition. If, it, if nothing else, we're on record as stating the broader interpretation. And I think it really is a case-by-case -case determination because these situations are so individual um, and what one person needs is, and, and I hope rare, mm -hmm. I would hope very yeah. rare, um, what one person needs may be totally different than what another person needs, so it, it really is an individual case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Well said. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, nothing to report at this time. I'm sorry. Uh, community relations? No report. Uh, facilities? I'm sorry. Curriculum, instruction, and assessment, and accountability? We will be meeting... I'm trying to find us. Um, I forgot. Oh, we meet on December 15th at 6 p.m. here. 
um, to discuss the issue that was brought up at um, our meeting two meetings ago. Facilities. We will meet again until January 22nd. Okay. Um, we all received, uh, you all saw a copy of a letter we got from the Human Rights Commission. Uh, they will be formed <coughs> in the package. It's in the package. Um, they, will, they have uh, formed a, uh, a committee and have asked us to join them in a joint committee um, to deal with the issue uh, that was brought by Mr. Harrington to this committee. Um, we have their, uh, the idea is to have three of us go. I'm willing to go. If there are two other people that have been willing to go, uh, Mr. Pierce and uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, I think just to make it official, uh, this, since this will be a joint subcommittee, uh, I'm going to call for a vote on that to appoint myself, Mr. Pierce, and uh, Dr. Seuss to this uh, joint subcommittee. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And I will, uh, through uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, contact the Human Rights Commission that we will, and then set out a doodle or something to uh, set a date for the first meeting. Thank you. Um, uh, what about the super eval? That's, that's the next one. Okay. Uh, joint subcommittee, you, I'm sorry, uh, superintendent eval committee met uh, Monday. Uh, you have in your package a uh, draft for uh, the event uh, superintendent evaluation timeline. Uh, if we can approve that tonight, uh, I would recommend that this goes to uh, policy to change the timeline that's there and replace it with this. If there's any discussion on it, I'd, I'd welcome it this time. Go ahead. Um, I wondered if, I didn't have big problems with the big picture of it, but right. just whether we want to be more specific, because we're working with the document the current evaluation thing we can be more specific that the superintendent is supplying <coughs> the professional practice goal and well, you know not just two goals okay and well uh what number are we talking number one and then number two um it's true those two are her well those two those, those two are, are required by the statute yes but they're required to be a student and a, and a per, and just a so we know practice. which ones are we well, can be more specific i mean that's all yeah. I'm, I'm also going to announce that we're going to have another subcommittee meeting next week mm -hmm. to work specifically on the goals to bring to this committee uh for the final meeting in december to follow this timeline i'm i meant the the type of goals it, it's she had to provide you know the first two you mean be the, specific uh, of what those goals are yeah I, that they were category yeah. I don't have the thing in front of me right now um, one is a, one is a student achievement goal and one is a practice goal yes so I think that put just yes. state those there yeah and then just the, be more specific on what those two are. right and then also what the subcommittee is providing mm -hmm. well we're going to be recommending to the full committee for discussion at the next meeting no I mean the subcommittee is will submit That's goals to the full committee. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the um, the superintendent evaluation has, there were the, here I'm pulling it up now so I can look at it. Okay, so there were the practice goal, the professional practice goal, the student learning goals, and then we would be providing the district improvement goals. And I think it should say well, that. It, it, it doesn't, it's not, necessarily it can be district improvement goals but it doesn't it isn't narrowed to just that we can we can come up with a uh, with a goal that is beyond that if we choose we can we can we can create a specific goal for our specific needs or goals okay I'm those are called the district improvement goals mm -hmm. it's just terminology okay right, fine right and it's that's just okay. i'm no just trying to make yeah. this no. the timeline fit with yes the timeline should goal. fit with the document we the have yes. to fill in that's all she yes. wants and you're that's saying number I'm three that's for number three that's for number three yes got it with those changes oh can i just ask a question in terms of setting this up um 
Is this a standing subcommittee? Because I don't think we ever voted. Yeah, yeah we did vote the committee. It was not, it, it's not a standing uh, subcommittee. Right. The question was asked. It would probably have to meet at least twice a year, once <coughs> right at this time to do the goal setting. So you're gonna, we're gonna have to vote this special subcommittee every year yes. to reestablish it? Yes. Because it's a year to year thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So should that be put in this, so that we remember that? Well, this isn't the, this isn't the committee. This, this is just the, the, the superintendent's timeline. Right. There may be a place that's required for it. I, I don't I'm know. not sure you need to start a new committee. You might, this could just be referred to community, to, to CIA. Yeah, yeah that's mm -hmm. in, in the past, that's where yeah. it's come yeah. from. Mm -hmm. um, before we started doing this whole eval system. Okay. The hope was to, to finally get a tool and get so the do timeline we done and then. Do we want to specify that the subcommittee shall be the CIA subcommittee? Because this is confusing. It's like mm -hmm. the superintendent evaluation again, subcommittee. Again, Judd, this is just the timeline. If you want to put, I mean, the, I don't know where it belongs. I have a problem right. shifting this off to someone else. Moving to the new system, Do you, I think is would you want to just pass it to policy to polish and this, this and needs to go into policy. Right. Okay. So no, why no, 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 no. I mean, pass it to the policy subcommittee well, to finish the. Well, I, I mean, think once it becomes voted, we can we can make it work with right. and fit within the policy. The only the only concern I'm having, Jesse, is that we're actually inter acting on this right now. The subcommittee that okay, so this you want is it going to meet next now. week. Yeah. Okay. If we can pass this for the corrections right now, and they need changing on a first and second reading, we can change it later like that. But this is the meat of it. If we can agree on the meat of it, this covers the whole year. We're coming also into a new aspect. I don't know if you, you all saw it. There will be a survey involved of some of the staff as well. Mm -hmm. And I, really, I, I would like to commend Ms. Stock. She took it upon herself. She, she saw the one that the DESI suggested. And it just doesn't apply for our needs, I think. And she's wanting to bring that forward. There'll be a couple more meetings on that. So with the suggested changes. Oh, okay, yeah. so I think Mr. Pierce has a good point, which is it has to be right now the timeline if refers to a committee, subcommittee that exists now, but will not necessarily exist in the future. So do you want to fix that uh, now, okay, or do you yeah. want to just wait Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, <clears throat> well, I think. How about an asterisk and just say the subcommittee in 2015-16 shall be part, it shall be in the well, uh, CIA. What if we just change evaluation subcommittee all the way through to, to curriculum instruction and assessment mm -hmm. subcommittee? Yeah. And then you just, the superintendent shall, uh, will submit two goals to the super. To you the, could say to evaluation subcommittee or CIA. I would just say evaluation CIA. No, because we've got you've got evaluation subcommittee right now, yeah. and I don't know if that's what you want to do with it now. Right? right? Are you guys ready to dissolve it? No. No. Okay. So but in the future, it? after April first, when we go, go back to uh, when we form a new committee, I think at that point we can pass Absolutely. it on. When are the goals due next? These goals. The next, first, this right meeting. Now. Wait, oh. the next meeting, the next, next school meeting. committee meeting, we will be uh, uh, agreeing on the goals. Okay. I would recommend we just stick with this right now and do a uh, policy. So we're just, it, it's not a formal policy. It's just a timeline that we're agreeing to for this. Right now. Okay. Time certain. Yes. Okay. okay. Timeline, not a policy. It's just a. With those corrections. But, but I mean, I do think that we should consider putting this into policy. Absolutely. So, so with the better language and stuff. And yeah, I, I'll be happy to bring this to policy and uh, consider. Oh, just send it to policy. I mean, just send it to policy. So well, we can, I, I've missed the last two. I don't know how quickly you go through those meetings without me. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor accepting that this timeline uh, with the corrections, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Was there a second? <coughs> second it. For the record. Are there any further announcements by any members of the committee mm -hmm. at this time? Remember, we added this mm -hmm. to our agenda. I'd just like to make a quick announcement. I, I, as a liaison to the Peer School, I met with their PTO last night, and they presented me with a list of um, their concerns and their hopes and issues for our 
upcoming budget, and I presented those to Dr. Bodhi in the form of an email today, and I'd like to, you know, perhaps go over that um, with her a little bit more in depth and, and then with the committee. Could I ask you also to submit that to the budget subcommittee as well, the copy? I'd be happy to. Yep. Any other members have an announcement at this time? It is my understanding that there is uh, no need for an executive session tonight. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.